Uh, we will now convene the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of April the 13th of 2023. Again, I'll note that all council members are present. Item one is to review the agenda we have for our Monday, April 17th meeting. So council, please refer to that document. Uh, Mr. Brady, do you have any presentations or anything you'd like to? We do, on? Mayor. Um, we would um, like to present on item 4I. Staff, let's come forward. Okay. Item 4I is a three-year term contract with two years of renewal options for demand response program services for the Energy Resources Department. Gentlemen, welcome. Morning, Mayor, Council. Morning. Uh, Scott Boucher. Uh, I am the Energy and Sustainability Director at the City of Mesa, and I'm joined today by Tony Cadorn and Tom Schieber who uh, will go into a little bit of detail on uh, the agenda item. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, we issued an RFP for what is called a demand response program, and we just wanna walk you through uh, what that is and what we're looking to do. So uh, the base, basis here is that the electric uh, market that we participate in is very volatile. So. Um, during normal times when temps aren't high or power plants aren't in service or pipelines aren't down, things are good, but uh, those sorts of things happen all the time. And so when that happens, uh, prices spike on the electric market, and so we're forced to purchase very expensive uh, spot market power. Um, these events are typically very short, um, lasting a day or less, and so when that happens, utilities look to purchase less of that energy. And so um, they implement what is called a demand response program where the utility can request um, customers who voluntarily sign up for these programs to use less energy. There's various forms of these uh, programs, uh, but the one that we are looking at is uh, a smart thermostat program similar to what APS and SRP do. And so, when we're able to reduce demand during these hours, that is helping every customer that is an electric utility customer because we're purchasing less, very expensive energy, um, which would typically be spread out across all the customers, but because we're avoiding those purchases, everybody saves and benefits. And so some other utilities in the area that have this program include APS, SRP, and uh, our friends down in Graham County, um, they all have programs where if you have a smart thermostat, you can register for their program. And during certain times of the year, they'll call on your thermostat to um, pre-cool the house. So it'll actually increase the temperature, or excuse me, decrease the temperature on the thermostat a few degrees. So pre-cool your house. Then during the event, it'll increase the temperature to maybe 80 degrees to reduce your air conditioning load. And then after the event, it'll bring it back to normal set point. And so, um, these programs are common throughout the nation, but we just wanted to bring to the forefront that uh, there's many programs here in Arizona that are already doing this. Uh, so <clears throat> when we purchase uh, power recently, we've been doing something called an all-source RFP, where we put it out to the market and say, anyone who has any power sources, whether it's uh, you know, solar or these sort of demand response programs, we're looking for whatever is available to us. Let us know what you have. And we did this in January 2022. And one of the vendors that does this responded as interested in doing this for Mesa. Um, we liked their submittal, but we said, we think maybe we can do better. And so we put out a specific RFP this year in January for demand response services. That closed in February. And we determined that a company called Virtual Peaker was the most responsive uh, vendor for that. And so we're seeking to mirror uh, SRP's bring your own thermostat program with this. Some highlights for the program. So this is what's called software as a service. Uh, so we don't have to host the software. We don't have to program anything. We don't have to do anything like that. This is fully administered by the company. All we do would be to, to log in and call on the software to reduce demand in our service territory. Um, so we like that because it's very hands off for us. Um, customers voluntarily sign up, and that's done through their thermostat app. So customers that have a Honeywell thermostat will sign up through that application on their phone, or uh, customers with a Nest thermostat will be able to do the same. 
Um, we're looking at a $50 incentive for customers who sign up. And again, because this is benefiting all customers more than that $50 incentive, we think that's a fair incentive to offer our customers for doing this. For the first year, to reduce upfront costs, we're only going to enroll customers who have Honeywell or Nest thermostats. There's other brands such as Ecobee, Emerson, and maybe even other brands, but we found uh, through the vendor that the most, uh, they were able to provide data on how many customers they think are in our service territory, and those two brands have the highest numbers of customers. So we think those are the greatest bang for the buck. Um, so we're gonna start by rolling out those two and then look at uh, implementing more as, as the years go by. And an important uh, question that we've gotten and that we've asked is that, is can the customers override it? So during these events, if they don't want their house at 80 degrees, can they override it? And the answer is yes. Uh, in all instances, they can override the, the call to adjust the thermostat. So there's a bit of a, a faith thing there that we're trusting that m the majority of our customers won't override it. And talking to SRP, they found that the majority don't. So um, we're confident that we can um, use the program to reduce demand. And then like I explained, it's a, it's a pre-cool before the event, then during the about four hours that we're trying to save money during peak, uh, peak electricity prices, it increases the thermostat, and then afterwards returns it to normal settings. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you, I'm sure. Uh, I, I love this idea. I mean, I, I think this is, uh, I, I was at um, South By in Austin a month ago and went, one of the presentations that I saw was on smart metering and smart thermostats and uh, uh, software programs that uh, are managing, you know, huge supplies right now. So I think this is very cutting edge. I'm glad to see us through this. So obviously, for our customers, we're going to give them smart meters, but what we're talking about here is smart thermostats. Am I understanding that correctly? That so, is correct. So uh, how do we encourage them to have smart thermostats? Do they get, get this program, I guess, would be one incentive, but yeah. otherwise. Do you know how many have them already? Yeah, so <clears throat> we think that there's enough out there already that we can start the program right now and not have to provide an incentive for them to buy a smart thermostat. So we view this first year as a rollout of just getting the program in place and established. And just the numbers from vendors, we feel there's enough to meet our goals this first year. Um, SRP, Tucson Electric Power, some of the bigger um, other utilities, they do have incentives to provide that thermostat to the customer. But we just want to get the, the program established see what the interest is, see if we can meet our goals without providing an incentive to actually buy the hardware. And if we're not meeting our goals, we're finding that we're just not getting the numbers we need, then we can move on to, to something like that where we're actually incenting the customers to buy a smart thermostat. All right, thank you. Ms. go forth. When you say meet our goals, what goals are you talking about? So we're trying to meet a thousand customers-ish or about a megawatt of demand reduction in three years. And so, um, we have 14,500 electric customers, and so that, you know, that 1,000 we feel is reasonable um, as a goal in three years. So how often do you predict that these events will happen? Right now, we're estimating that we'd use about six events a month during the summer. Um, the, there are limits in each device's terms and conditions, so Honeywell, um, Nest, they have limits uh, that they work out with their customers as far as how many times you can call these events. And that limit is actually very high. So we're, we're looking to stay well under that limit and still achieve our goals of achieving savings with this. How long has this been around, this, this kind of program? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it, I know SRP has had the program for many years. I, I can't tell you exactly how many years that they've had it, but it's, it's an established program in SRP. I and think the, 2017 is about when it came into Arizona. Oh, okay. Yeah. And just curious as why now that we're, we just gotten to the point where the energy is so expensive, it's, this is another, another avenue to I, save. I think when there's a couple of things. So from a financial standpoint, it can save not only the city money and then when the city saves, then the, the customers mm -hmm. and the electric utility will be able to save but it also fits in with the climate action plan too. 
because um, any energy that we don't use and we don't need to purchase then is less carbon emissions that we're we're have so um, it fits hand in hand with what we're trying to accomplish and uh, I think it's one of those things it's it's a large elephant when we talk about our aspirational goals and it's just these small bites that we're taking uh, as we move through thank you council other questions on this uh, my last, and I'm sure Mr. Freeman, go ahead, Mr. Freeman. You go ahead. Well, I, I think I'm going to say what you're about to say, which is I think that this just, uh, again, reminds us of the fact that we have electric supply issues. And I don't think it, that's not unique to Mesa, Arizona. That's the world that we live in. So I, I still uh, like the idea of us uh, entertaining, looking at it, getting into the electric production uh, business perhaps partnering even with SRP on some gas powered turbines because I know they're We're interested about that yeah yeah so yeah on on Monday we'll be back with the energy resources budget presentation at study session and um, we have a slide that's dedicated to um, what we're doing now and thoughts for the future did I guess right, Mr. Freeman? You did. You did, Mayor. You're <laughs> spot on. All right. And I just going to add because of the volatility in the you know, electrical market, some of the electricity is not produced by climate action. You know, it's by coal generated plants mm -hmm. and WAPA to begin with, which hydroelectric, which is I consider somewhat climate action. However, there's other uh, things that denote that. But you know, I was going to ask a question on this programming. You said SRP is pretty successful with their programming. Do you have some me uh, metrics or data on that from them? Did they share that with you? And then my other question was, the last one is, what is the overall cost of the thermostat to the customer with a $50 incentive? I mean, they have to come up with the rest of the money, correct, yes. to purchase the therm? Yes, yeah, so I've been uh, talking with the SRP uh, program manager and uh, uh, for the last several months, he's been helping us along the way. He mentioned they have about 150 megawatts of demand response capacity out there, right? And he's, um, he's got about 70,000 thermostats in their program. And um, they've learned every year that they've had been doing this, how to tweak it better, you know, when to pre-call, maybe when to not how long the duration should be so you don't discourage customers, you know, you don't want to. Uh, so, um, and as far as the thermostats, in our, in our um, electric service area, there's an estimated uh, 6,000 uh, <coughs> or so smart thermostats out there already. So, the uh, consultants and the firms that do provide this software as a service for smart thermostats without any marketing at all they say if you get the word out you can expect 10 to 15 percent of those existing thermostats to sign up for your program so that gets us to that megawatt level right gotcha and in the agreement we assumed uh, we targeted by year two but in the financials we ran we wanted to make sure if we don't do that until year three, we're still uh, we're still good present worth wise. It's about a hundred thousand dollars to the plus side. The first year you have uh, some cost for getting everything set up, and once you're once you get things rolling, it really works out for us. Um, you know, as far as the cost of electricity, last September, you know, uh, Cal ISO California had a number of uh, statewide flex alerts asking people because of the problem with the uh, uh, capacity to serve demand. And uh, the, they had price shot up to, to a couple points to $2,800, $2,800 a megawatt hour. So we didn't buy at that price, right? So we look back, you know, we've got, uh, we've got uh, agreements with some counterparties for some peak in the summer and base load got the 15 megawatts of hydropower but in the, in the summertime we're up we don't cover everything with that you know we're pushing 90 megawatts <coughs> so we're on the market we go i have to use wapa western area power administration to secure uh, power to serve our load and um, you know we've historically paid upwards of 600 dollars 450 to 600 dollars so that's the part we're looking to shave this summer, maybe it's more than that. It's 
did you want to answer the cost of the thermostat or so we are looking at with existing customers as we roll this out um, as we see demand for it we you know really this is just starting the program and so as we start the program we don't want to overwhelm um, either residents or ourselves as staff as it rolls out we're going to see as tony was saying what the participation is like with existing customers that have existing smart thermostats and then if the demand and we're seeing the benefits that we think we will then we'll be coming back and, and probably having a program together that then would say, okay, here's an incentive that we could provide for others possibly. But as of right now, we're looking at, there's a lot of existing smart thermostats out in our service area. Let's take advantage of that with those um, customers that are there already, and then we'll move to the next step. So this is kind of phase one of this program. Gotcha, okay. Answers my question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Summers. Is this residential and <coughs> commercial customers? Just residential. Just residential, yes. Okay. So I'm curious, could we integrate our city facilities inside our Mesa district to smart thermostats and sign up in the program? I think we're already on well, that. Yeah, so with, yeah, I don't look at the wall, so I don't know if we have uh, With our city facilities, we're managing those with more um, building automation systems that um, are in place that are uh, run through our facilities department. So we're already doing a similar type of thing. Similar type thing on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to just during these events. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, Ms. Duff. Um, yes, I have a few comments. I, I, first of all, I just make, like to make a statement to whoever's listening. That yes, there's the $50 incentive to, to sign up, but you know the overall value is m more one for our entire electric grid within the city of Mesa. Because if we have to go to market and buy at these crazy rates when things peak, then overall that raises our, our prices of what we have to pay for energy um, for everybody. And so it's more of, I think the, beyond the $50, it's more of being able to preserve as much as we can a reasonable rate to our customers within the city of Mesa. Mm -hmm regardless if you have a smart meter or not, because there is no cost savings as, as far as the price of electricity if you have the smart meter, other than getting a $50 um, rebate or incentive, $50 incentive to sign up. Mm -hmm. It's for the, the greater good. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Anyway, yeah. And I assume and the software that we're running on the virtual peaker, um, it's $150,000 the first year, 112 the other. That is, I assume well in savings of what we would pay if we were able to, if we had to buy on the market during these peak times. Yeah, so as we look at that over the three year period that the contract is in place, that's what Tom was talking about, that we do anticipate there will actually be savings for the city after we've paid for this software as a service. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. And that's if electric is available. I've heard some stories from SRP <coughs> and various that sometimes when with the move to electrification, we lost a coal generating and hydropower is declining. All these pressures that we have in our growing economy that sometimes during peak, it's just like good luck finding electric on the market. Yeah, or the, the electric that is out there is, is very expensive. That's what we were talking about with yeah, Tony's yeah. chart that he shows those peaks that happen. Yeah, so I'm very glad that we're moving into this right. so we can control our own destiny and reliability in the city of Mesa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Council, any other questions <clears throat> on this item? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to supporting this on Monday. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Brady, anything else on this agenda you'd like to point out to us? That was, that was the one. All right. Thank you. Council, any questions regarding Monday's agenda? Okay. We'll uh, obviously have Monday to talk about it as well. Uh, if there's no objection, then we'll move on to item 2A on our agenda for today, which is a presentation and to provide direction on the police department's budget. This is a big deal. Got the brass in. Chiefs and chief and chief and chief. Good to have you with us. 
and the biggest chief, Krista. Yeah, Krista is like the boss. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Let's just be honest here. <laughs> Please make sure you introduce everybody for the... Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, uh, City Management. Thank you for um, having us today. Uh, to my left, I have Fiscal Manager uh, Krista York. I also have uh, Assistant Chief Ed Wessing, Assistant Chief Lee Rankin, and Assistant Chief Dan Butler. Um, I think you know who they are, but I went out of order. So, um, And then in the bullpen, I have Assistant Chief Gina Nesbitt, who will be very eager to come up here and and address any questions you have. We just didn't have enough chairs, but she is certainly a, a huge part of our team and, and presentation today. Um, thank you for having us this morning. Um, I just want to jump right in and we'll talk about our, our public purpose, like what we're here for um, as the City of Mesa Police Department is serving the citizens of Mesa. And we partner with our community to prevent and reduce uh, crime and ensure procedural justice by treating everybody with respect and preserving human rights and ensure procedural justice. Um, that's core to our mission. Um, that is uh, sung across every area of our department with our sworn and professional staff building on that. And I think what you'll see today in the presentation is our priorities and objectives are certainly in line with the city's uh, priorities and objectives that were um, uh, created by the council and mayor and city management and you'll see it intertwined, but crime and safety and, and the health of our community is going to be uh, key in this presentation. And when you talk about um, our priorities and objectives, and these are just some that are on our strategic initiatives of many, but we're gonna highlight the reducing of, of crime and increasing citizen safety, um, the innovation and in integrating technology, and the strategic staffing, hiring, and retaining the best candidates, and then exceptional organizational effectiveness and how we're investing in our people and their wellness and their leadership. Um, when we talk about um, inclusivity and innovation, and when we talk about innovation in our department as well, it's listening to our folks and the ideas that they have and the ability to bring them forward. It's more than just a piece of technology. It's our people and investment in our people and understanding that they have unique perspectives to take us to the next level. And you talk about inclusivity, we realize that we are just one cog in the wheel of, of 4,000 incredible employees and uh, the city of Mesa and all these great departments and also the citizens and earning their trust and legitimacy every day. Um, you know, that's very important to us as well. So today what you're going to hear, um, hear us talk about is again, a little bit of that, about the technology to solve crime, public safety being forefront in everyone's mind. Um, are you able to, um, you know, walk down the street and enjoy the parks and enjoy our, our, our incredible city and bring your businesses and live and thrive in Mesa. So we're gonna talk about how we use that technology and the resources the city has provided and, and what our plan is for the next year to continue that, um, that effort and the state of the art forensics and everything that we have that are a big investment of resources by the council and by city management. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. We'll talk about our public safety engagement and how we're gonna increase our engagement in our downtown district in the areas um, that are growing so much that we're so proud to see and, and what our plan is and what we would like to see um, uh, to be able to use the resources for in our downtown area as well, which really affect the entire city. And then talk about our efficiencies and transparencies to the public. You know, something as simple as, as um, you know, ordering a, a recording or, or getting a, a report in our records division, that's a big part of a city's efficiency and transparency and how we're going to invest or ask to uh, be invested resources to make that even more efficient and, um, and, and run better uh, for the future and the future growth of our department. And then our employment investment uh, in our, our wellness and the succession plan that we have for our folks. They're our most important uh, resources, our people. They're gonna take us into the future. So we're gonna talk about how we want to uh, you know, invest in our folks uh, to carry out all these initiatives that you'll see in front of you. And then we'll talk about the efficiency and resource allocation 
out on the street. Um, who's answering the calls every day? Where are they answering the calls? How are we doing that? And how are those resources going to be allocated uh, in the future? And, and how does that tie into making the city of Mesa one of the safest cities our size in the United States? And we're very proud about that. So with that, that will segue into our next slide. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Chief Dan Butler to talk about our performance measures and talk about our crime in the city of Mesa. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Um, this is a great topic for us today. Uh, as always, we're incredibly proud of what we do in our, with our policing model. Um, and I think it's something that our, our community and council is certainly proud of as well. Um, so for the next three slides, we will go over um, our crime as it, as it relates to Part A crime uh, in our city, but we'll also do a comparison so you have an understanding of where we sit with like agencies, not only in our state, but across the nation. Um, so. Like Chief Koss said, Mesa is one of the safest cities, um, our size, large cities in the entire nation. Um, in fact, what you'll see on the next slide is there's one city that uh, is ahead of us, um, but I always have a little bit of bias when I talk about that city, So, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll give you that in just a little bit. But as we sit right now, um, our crime rate per thousand is 60.6 uh, per thousand residents. Um, our par A person's crimes, we had a, a very slight increase from the last year in 2021 from to 2022 and then but our part a property crimes had a significant decrease at 11 percent for year to year um, so if we can transition to the next slide i'll start getting into the comparison aspect <clears throat> yes Ms. Duff. before we leave that slide um macy pd switch switch from ucr to nib RS. That's correct. What is that? And so NIBRS is switch? the National Incident Based Reporting System. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we made the transition. We were one of the first in the nations in 2019 before it came mandatory in January of 2021. Uh, the National Incident Based Reporting System is a broad scoped and has the intent of understanding crime on a more human level than the <coughs> previous UCR. Uh, the previous UCR was a federal system developed in the 30s. Um, for the entire country to track crime and to try to have a comparison. This system asks for more details. It's 56 categories, uh, 50, or two, 52 crimes across 24 offenses. So it's very specific and it has humanistic categories and it's in the, with the intent of the national government to try to understand crime at a much more in-depth level. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, uh, this, this is the slide that I'm talking about. Uh, we have seen something similar to this the last <coughs> several years, and it gives us an indication of where we stand on the national level. Now, if you look on this slide, you'll see it's 2021 NIBRS Part A data. Clearly, we're in 2023, so you would think that we're talking about 2022 data. However, only 60% of the, the agencies across the nation have gotten to the point that we are. So we're very limited in how we can look at the data comparatively to everybody. But the agencies that you see on this slide are agencies like Mesa that are very comparable. If you look at the population line uh, going from left to right, it gives you, it's, it's the orange line. It gives you an indication of where they are size-wise. Um, and then it gives you, with the bars, it gives you an indication of where they fall um, crimes per thousand residents. Now, Virginia Beach is the agency or the city that I was talking about just a little bit ago. Um, they continue to be a little bit better than us, um, but when we look at why they're a little bit better than us, Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach has a massive military population. Um, some estimates are as low as 118, and then I've seen numbers up to 200,000 people. Um, so that's a population within that city um, that offsets crime a little bit some of military personnel don't get into any trouble like a regular society and some of that is military personnel are governed by the uniform code of military justice so they have their own laws and that's how they that's how they interact with their folks uh, but as you can see we continue I'm sorry, to Ms. go for it oh, no, yes. I, you can finish <clears throat> as you can see we continue to um, do very good in this topic and it's something that we all should be very proud of uh, Ms. go for if we could go back I apologize to the previous, yeah. The, the um, Part A property crimes, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the NIBRS being more specific. How many, how do you break down the property crimes? Are there several categories within that? There are several categories okay. of property crimes. Has anything gone up? Have they all overall gone down? Are there areas that maybe? For this presentation, what I looked at was the overall. Uh, because I look at this data recently, I know our vehicle thefts 
is a property crime that is either even or up, but it depends on month to month. To answer your question, I don't, I'd have to get back to you specifically, but I know that just because I look at the data on a monthly basis. Right, so you do check, so, right. okay. And, I mean, so let me give you an example of, of NIBRS. So when we're talking about stolen vehicles, there can be fluctuations in these crime types. Um, so an electric scooter, when we have a theft of that, it is classified by the national government as a stolen vehicle. Um, so that has an influence on our, our auto thefts. And we're thinking auto thefts as an actual vehicle, but a, a, a scooter, an electric scooter, counts as a stolen vehicle for our property crime. So there are variations within that system that we still continually adapt to. Do you bring up vehicle because, has it gone down? It's gone up. No, no, it's gone up. It's gone up. Okay, okay. Mr. Redia. On the, can you explain the Part A person crimes and is it a reflection of, I know we went to NIBRS on from 20 to 21. Is, did you all, is this a reflection of an increase based on capturing more data uh, moving from UCR to NIBRS? So two questions there. So th this, is a, this is an incredibly complex one to sure. answer, and I love the question, uh, Vice Mayor. The, there are portions just like what I gave an example of with um, stolen vehicles and scooters sure, yeah. with this. So for example, um, one of the crazes that we have in our community are those Orbeez guns. They're little gel bullets that are you know, oh, yeah. projectiles that all of the young people around the community go around and they play games and they shoot each other. Well, if they shoot somebody else that isn't playing in their games, that's classified as an aggravated assault uh, through the NIBR system. Now, we don't file charges like that in most instances because it doesn't rise to the state level of aggravated assault. So there is fluctuation <coughs> with that. So there, there are changes for sure between UCR and NIBRS. Um, the way that data is correlated, collected, and counted within the system will cause increases and decreases in some areas with how we look at the data. I would say until the entire nation is utilizing NIBRS and they're utilizing it consistently like it's designed to be utilized, and then years pass down the road, we won't have some type of equilibrium with how we're looking at the data. So it's incredibly difficult to compare NIBRS data to UCR data because it's data that's collected from different sources and viewed differently in the system. So per your expertise, as far as the trend, uh, as far as uh, Part A person crimes, it is, has that remained the same based on, on what's, what's happened over, I know there's no graph, it shows other cities, but us, um, among our, uh, among the city of Mesa, it, over the last five years, I say, is that a trend uh, that's maintained kind of similar, just fluctuations maybe? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, what I would say is we have seen an cre increase, increase in party person's crimes, uh, for sure. Uh, but it's a moderate increase, certainly com okay. in, compared, in, in comparison to, uh, to other agencies of our size and even other agencies within the state. Um, I couldn't tell you right now how much of it has to do, just because I don't know, sure. with the transition from UCR to NIBRS. So and what, what's the uh, Part A person crimes? What's the definition of those crimes? Or what's the categories that you uh, um, capture? Assaults, aggravated assaults, yeah. rape, robbery, um, homicides. Um, am I missing any of them? I, th I, th I think that's basically covers them. Assault, misdemeanor assault. Yeah, misdemeanor assault. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, on this particular slide, is there any more questions, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, before we move to the final slide? On I think we're good to go. So what we wanted to do is provide another uh, data source uh, for us to talk about. The last couple of slides we talked about uh, a little bit of UCR, which was the past system, and also NIBRS. Uh, this one, we took the data from the Major City Chiefs Association. Uh, this is the uh, 72 largest police agencies in North America, which includes Canada. Um, and every year, these agencies submit their crime data to the major cities, and the major city publishes a survey. So we wanted to take a sample of comparable cities, um, and there's, there is an outlier, there's a city here that's a little bit larger than the comparable cities on here, and you can kind of see it all the way on the right. Uh, but we wanted to show you how we fare with another age, or two other agencies in the state, and then comparable cities across the nation. Now, 
for this survey, there are four crime types that, that go into it, and it's homicide, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults. So simple assaults uh, fall off of, off of this. But as you can see, we, are, we fall, you know, with our population size, uh, 4.1 um, of these major or these violent crimes per thousand residents, and this gives the close comparison to other agencies um, of our size. And that this is 2022 data, so it is more contemporary data. Next slide. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. In May 2022, the Center for Disease Control released new statistics regarding gun violence uh, during the first year of the pandemic. <clears throat> in 2020, the United States saw the highest firearms homicide rate in over 25 years, where 79% of all homicides involved the use of crime guns. This was a 35% increase year over year from 2019. These statistics are consistent with what the residents of the city of Mesa have experienced over the last two years. In 2021 and in 2022, 74% of our homicides were crime gun related. So far in 2023, 84% of our homicides are crime gun related. The Mesa Police Department is committed to combating crime gun violence related to homicides and non-fatal shootings within the city of Mesa. In October of 2022, the Mesa Police Department became one of six agencies in Arizona which have partnered with ATF to join the National Integrated Ballistic Information or NIBIN Correlation Center. What does that mean? NIBIN is the only national network that allows for the capture and comparison of ballistic evidence to aid in solving and preventing crimes through firearm violence within 24 to 48 hours. As a recent example, between January 4th and January 24th of this year, five gun stores were burglarized during the theft, 61 guns were stolen. Throughout the extensive investigation, uh, shell casings were discovered and associated to potential leads. These shell casings were entered into the Niven Correlation Center and within 48 hours, those shell casings were tied to a murder of a 14-year-old child, two unsolved drive-by shootings, and two shootings within Phoenix. The extraordinary work of these detectives and the partnership with ATF resulted in four suspects being charged with murder and a multitude of other violent crimes. It is unfortunate within just the mere two-week time frame, these 61 stolen guns resulted in the murder of a child, a double homicide in Phoenix, multiple drive-by shootings, a shootout with police in Kansas where three police officers were shot and the suspect was killed. So through local, state, and federal partnerships and the ongoing support of this council in authorizing the purchase of additional NIBIN technology, the implementa implementation of the Real-Time Crime Center, and the addition of investigative personnel, our department continues to close the gap between a gun offense and identification and arrest of violent offenders. The arrest rate or clearance rate of homicide suspects in Mesa stands well over 90%, which is well above the national average of 50%. This is a testament to the hard work and dedication of the men and women of the Mesa Police Department. The major city chiefs. Oh. Okay, go ahead. My, answer my question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The major city chiefs association reported at least one of the factors that contribute to the proliferation of guns is theft of firearms from vehicles and residents. In the city of Mesa, an average of 470 guns are stolen every year, ultimately contributing to gun violence. The majority of stolen firearms are handguns, and a majority of those stolen are from vehicles. In 2023, the Mesa Police Department will be engaged in an educational campaign to raise awareness of responsible gun ownership. This will include messaging through social media, community events, and crime prevention. 
The goal will be to reduce accessibility of guns to those that choose to commit firearm-related violence within our city. In 2022, crime gun seizures in the city of Mesa were up by 25% when compared to 2020, which is both a reflection of the work conducted by our officers and also the total increase of guns within our community. Through the use of technology, streamlined workflow, and focus on gun-related violence, we are committed to further increasing the removal of crime guns from our streets. Yes, Ms. Duff. I can go ahead and answer the question. I'm trying to absorb this, but I wanted to ask the increase of gun-related crimes, homicides, I guess for the most part, is it directly correlated, I don't know if you know, with the illegal acquisition through stealing them or whatever the, the method is of, of guns? I mean, is there a correlation between increases of gun-related crimes <coughs> and I, I guess there would be of, of illegally acquiring guns in various forms? The mayor, vice mayor, council member Duff, I think the portion of stolen guns really represents a small portion of the amount of uh, the guns that are within our community. So in 2020, on a nationwide level, we saw the increase of gun sales r rise by 64%. Really? In Arizona, the increase was by 104%. Really? So there's a lot of different factors that um, uh, people have uh, examined uh, some of those factors include um, COVID, the lockdown, fear of government, the election in 2020. Uh, these are just some of the factors that have been cited that really led to this increase that we've seen both nationwide and in the state of Arizona. Okay, so just an increase in guns overall, regardless of how they're acquired legally or illegally, has it increasing. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, According to research, the guns there, and crimes. there's about 120 guns for every 100 residents. Really? Yes, ma'am. That's incredible. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Pillsbury. So, yeah, I guess that was my question on this is I'm not sure if higher numbers are better or not, right? Because is that saying that there's just more guns to recover and seize or that we're doing better at recovering and seizing the guns that are out there? I mean, you don't know, right? I don't. I'm just trying to figure out the, what we're reading on the graph. I think there's a combination of the two. We are seizing more guns, but then again, as you pointed out, there are more guns on the street. So that's why we believe that uh, through the work that we've been engaged in in the last two years, the Correlation Center is a huge win for the city of Mesa. Uh, up until this year, we had not been part of ATF's Correlation Center. That allows us to change our workflow, to gather those shell casings, to provide it to ATF, they, their return on that evidence is within 24 to 48 hours. And it's really closer to 24 hours than it is 48 hours. And that provides our investigators with potential leads that then again, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, allows us to close the gap from the time of the incident to the time someone is identified, arrested, and then uh, brought before a judge. So I guess when, when you guys are looking at your data, and you see maybe a lower number from last year, is your assumption that you didn't seize as many guns or that there weren't as many guns out? I mean, how, how are you reading the data? Right, there's not fewer guns. Um, it, it does have- So you want the number to go up? We want the number of seizures of crime guns to go up. And we make a very specific distinction between uh, firearms and crime guns, but we're talking about when we talk about crime guns, is those that are using firearms for illegal purposes. We're not talking about seizure of law-abiding right. firearms, yeah. right? Okay. I okay. Thanks. This has got to be Chris's slide because I don't think the other guys know how to talk about the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, sure. Council I'm sorry, Members. Mr. Freeman. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 
I wrote some notes down here, typed them in for Chief Rankin. I think the messaging, Chief, is what you're sending is because we're so proactive in solving our crimes in the city of Mesa that gangs and other individuals that Mesa is proactive in solving our crime and then they do not want to do, I'll use the word business in Mesa. Is that kind of somewhat that you're referring to? That is the correct assessment. That is correct. I think the level of efficiency that we've achieved, not only through the implementation of the Real Time Crime Center, uh, one of the things that I'll mention later is that the last 13 homicides have been solved in part through the use of the Real Time Crime Center. So the, uh, some of these crimes, which may have taken us weeks or months to solve, are now being solved within a matter of days. So as, as we know, uh, those engaged in criminal behavior uh, tend to flock together and uh, they understand uh, um, where they uh, um, uh, should not do their business because of the interactions with those that uh, are now in jail and how quickly they were in jail based on the work that our officers have done. Yeah, I just applaud that we're using technology to our advantage. And I know the operations that your department has done and been proactive throughout the year and, and past years have been very successful in reducing crime in our city. For a city of our size, we've done remarkably well. And then I, you know, I, I looked at the 90% success rate on homicide, you know, recovery and solving those crimes. That, that's huge because it's, again, that sense of messaging. And then, you know, even if you are a responsible gun owner, to my point is you, you have the responsibility to control that gun, to lock it up, to keep it so that it cannot be stolen or used for other crime issues. So, I mean, that, there's messaging out there for that on both sides of the fence. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members. Before you is the expenditure summary for the Mesa Police Department. It's how we ended last fiscal year, where we are at on our current fiscal year 22-23 revised budget, as well as where we're projecting to land for the current fiscal year, and then the proposed budget for fiscal year 23-24. This is a summary of the consolidation of all of the police department's funding sources. So it includes not only the general governmental funds, but also the public safety sales tax funds, and then grant and other restricted funds. Um, the first item I kind of want to bring your attention to and highlight is the $21.6 million increase you see from our year-end actual to the current revised budget. There's several items that are impacting that that I think are important to mention. One is this includes the 5% um, inflationary adjustment, which was added to our baseline budget for the fiscal year. And then we also have the impact from the 5% mid-year market adjustment, which was done last January for all city personnel. Um, additionally, this includes the step pay that was approved last July for um, eligible employees. And then for the police department, it also includes the fourth year additions of staffing under our public safety staffing um, rollout plan. As far as our fiscal year 22-23 year end estimate, we're currently projecting to have a $7 million um, overage. This is partially due to our fleet expenditures, which have proven to be um, quite significant this fiscal year, really just based upon the current market conditions. Um, also, keep in mind that personal services make up over 80% of the police department's budget. So anything that impacts personnel has a widespread impact. So included in that overage for the current year are the one-time payments that were made um, in January to our non-mission critical staff, as well as the uh, separation payouts for members who are either retiring or otherwise separating from the police department and then additionally impacting our personal services budget for the current fiscal year is over time incurred um, in excess of our budget. Now, included within the fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget, a couple of items to highlight and then we'll go into more detail in the future slides, is that we have uh, $10.3 million uh, to go towards the public safety personnel uh, retirement system, the PSPRS, 
for that unfunded liability smoothing, which actually is very comparable to the current fiscal year. Also reflected is the step pay recommendations for eligible employees come July. And then of course we have the fifth year rollout of our public safety sales tax staffing plan. So with that, unless you have any questions, we're ready to delve into, okay. Okay, I think we're gonna do She was hoping. Yeah. Uh, nice um, try. <laughs> I was just wondering what the large decrease from the training and wellness is from the year end estimate to the proposed budget. Yes, that's an awesome question, Council Member um, Spillsbury. Our recruits are all housed at the training and wellness activity. They tend to run us about 9.5 million annually. We have 3 million of that budgeted. So what we do throughout the year, as the year progresses, we know we're gonna to need to transfer in an additional six and a half million. So where we have vacancy savings or other savings identified throughout the department, we move those funds over to cover the, the cost of the recruits. Okay, and so as far as the wellness side, are you gonna talk about that in the future presentation? I mean, you'll get, I'll get more information on that. We do have. I wanted to make sure that wasn't a reflection of a decrease in funds going towards wellness programs. So. Not at all. Okay. Okay. Great. I had the same question. Okay. So we're good. Thank you, Mr. You too, Mr. Reddy. Uh, in addition, the technical service services from twenty one twenty two to now, uh, what's the the increase there? A lot of the technical services is that we have got um, close to, I'm thinking, $3 million in annual software licensing and renewal charges. And every year we see that go up anywhere from 5 to 8%, you know, upwards. So we do tend to project and expect to see for the, the technology that the police department has an increase as well within that area. So that technology, is that like the Axon the, uh, or software for? Yes, it's, it's that as well as the police department is the primary overseers of a lot of the, the CCTV and the Secure, which we'll also be dis discussing. We're expanding those programs and the, the areas that we're covering. And so that's also contributing to the increase. Okay. Great, any other questions? Okay, Ms. Duff. Um, and then just looking at alterations in um, the budget expenditure on the chief's office line mm -hmm. in the 23-24 is a little bit of a jump comparatively to the professional services. So, yes. Yeah, Council Member Duff. The reason for that is that for anti-racketeering funds, we always budget the annual appropriation within the chief's office initially, and then as the expenditures are approved, we then allocate them out to the appropriate areas to go to. So that's where it starts out larger and then the dollar amount drops um, throughout the year. We just, that's, it's our RICO or anti-racketeering and then we move it out to the appropriate areas. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, good morning, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I want to segue into some budget adjustment requests as part of our overall presentation and primarily talk about people. Um, we do believe at Mesa PD, to answer your question, that our people are our most valuable resource. And the Chief has made it a priority uh, hiring, uh, training, and also retention and recruitment. Um, as part of uh, ongoing uh, as Chris mentioned, a six-year staffing plan that we brought to council first back in 1920 related to the public safety sales tax. So before you, you will see those numbers that are reflective of the additions um, to both sworn and professional staff um, since that initial ask in 1920. Uh, prior to fiscal year 22-23, we have already added 81 uh, total positions to our authorized budgeted uh, personnel numbers. In fiscal year 22-23, we added an additional 25, and moving into 23-24, we uh, look to add an additional 14. Um, we broke this down for you, especially we get asked quite often, the number of patrol officers. And you'll see that the overall adds in our six-year plan to the patrol bureau was 62 full-time sworn positions. Now understand that also includes supervisory personnel because as we increase squad numbers, we also have to add those supervisory personnel. So, Mayor, just I think 
this is a, to me, this is the slide of the budget, of the entire budget. This is where we say Mace is all in on public safety. When it talks about funding public safety, these are um, men and women, get more men and women on the street, patrolling the streets of Mesa. This is delivering on the commitment of the public safety sales tax. And in addition, uh, other funding. But um, I think it's remarkable, and I think, and make sure I'm saying this right, that last column is really just trying to sh make that point, right? Since the sales tax was initiated, we're trying to show the cumulative total the increment that we're adding to the system. Am I, That's that correct, correct, Mr. Brady, yes. So that final column is kind of where, you know, we made the commitment that on the sales tax we would deliver um, more police personnel, and there they are, 62 patrol officers, the 25 other sworn, 42 professionals, so far 129 positions. There's not too many. We could go back to that big city chart and, and do not just do crime now, but do commitment to public safety and adding additional staff. So. Um, I think um, as well as we're doing now from a public safety standpoint, and obviously there are pressures, um, societal, um, a lot of other pressures on crime, you can see that the city has a significant commitment even in the few years ahead to continue to add resources, personnel um, to the police department. So I just want to make sure <laughs> this slide gets the attention that it needs to, so thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Pillsbury. I think that's an incredible point to make, and I, I guess that makes me curious of where we're at. Like, you hear on the radio of cities that have shortages of police officers, so where are we at in the city of Mesa? Are we short police officers? Are we, you know? Well, I promised I did not plant this question, but I'm actually <laughs> going to discuss that right, right now in so, the very okay. next slide, so great question, Councilor. Okay. Um, this is actually a slide that I'm uh, quite proud of. Uh, when we looked at an analysis of our vacancies, um, quite honestly, uh, I was somewhat surprised at the numbers that we're experiencing when we talk about um, the shortages that you hear not only regionally but across the country. Whereas other agencies our size are seeing significant reduction um, because of the continued support of both city management and council, we've been actually able to buck that curve. And you will see here in the graph, and it's broken down by both patrol sworn, overall sworn, and their overall strength, that currently our sworn uh, uh, positions are 93% filled. That leaves us a 7% uh, uh, number of positions that are unfilled. That, that adds a total of 58 positions that are currently unfilled. Um, and when you look at um, the projections uh, that we're seeing now, a lot of that had to do with our unexpected vacancies, unexpected departures. And we saw traditionally, and we go back 20 years of historical data, we average about 25 to 6 people that leave unexpectedly. Now we factor in known retirements, we factor in the normal attrition that we see in the academy process, in the entire training process, and that's how we come up with this number of 25. And that is how we base our hiring numbers throughout the year. And it's a fluid number as we see more people that leave the department for unexpected reasons. We can adjust that number to be ahead of the curve. Um, in 20, uh, fiscal year 1920, our unanticipated separations were 25. We saw that increase to 36 and 41 the following two years. Currently, uh, we are seeing about a 40% reduction in that, and we're projected to only have 28 unexpected separations in this current fiscal year. We do believe that's largely in part to some of the incentive programs that the city's implemented, and specifically the uh, medical uh, for life program benefit that was rolled out earlier in this year. Um, so as we uh, continue to see those types of incentive programs and, and reasons to retain these employees, I expect to see that 7% be reduced even further and begin to get closer towards the 100% overall staffing. And I'll move into the next slide because it even touches on this a little bit further. This slide is, is one that I just want to point out a couple things. In the blue, uh, large, uh, dark blue graphs, you'll see where our total authorized strength for sworn positions has grown from 761, and in the next fiscal year, we'll top out at 850 sworn positions. That's an increase of 71 sworn positions overall. That's directly correlated to the support of our community uh, council and city management. You'll also see on the yellow line, those are the public safety sales, sales tax positions um, that were part of those overall increases. 
Um, and then on top, you'll notice this blue line, and that's what we call our pipeline officers. We are very unique in the city of Mesa to have this program. I am not aware of any other organization in the country that functions in their hiring and retention process that we do here. And what you'll see is that right there, that top line, currently there are 66 officers that are in the pipeline process. These are police officer recruits that are in some form of training. Now we have to understand that the training process is currently 52 weeks before uh, they are able to work as a solo police officer. So we have actually taken that process and converted it into our projections for hiring. And with the support of council and city management, we're able to actually hire above that authorized budget, budgeted strength, which allows us to be, I, I would say, very fluid in those numbers. As more people leave unexpectedly, we can add more to that process. And if less, we can adjust our hiring projections for the next academy classes. So in the last slide, I mentioned that 7% of those positions are currently unfilled or vacant. If you look at just the sheer number of 66, that represents close to 8% of our totalized strength. So as they complete their training, they funnel into those positions. Um, we're actually 1% over um, where our authorized budget uh, strength should be. Um, so th this is a unique uh, situation which we are extremely proud of, which allows us to be a year ahead of the curve uh, than not only our regional partners, but, but across the country. Um, when we attend the major city chiefs and ICP conferences, this is something that uh, we talk about at length, and it's an extremely proud moment uh, for us here in Mesa to have uh, this type of a, a problem, which is not really a problem, if, if you understand what I'm saying. So it's, We create overhire positions correct. for the academy, so they don't, get, they don't get counted in the current authorization, so that, because otherwise most uh, cities across the country will have their authorized position and you can't even in the recruits you can't you can't go above that but that, this is creates as Ed just explained very well we really recognize this if you do it that way it always puts you you're always a little behind right in trying to get those positions in this case we're trying to get ahead and give us more flexibility and then it was well um, um, the the chiefs here have done a great job of also maximizing the capacity or the efficiency of our academies and running um, three academies and getting uh, even just even that part of it too is just being able to keep that pipeline um, active and full I guess. Uh, that's correct Mr. Brady. Currently we operate three police academies a year. Traditionally our academy was two um, and they were broken up into six month segments. Well now we have several academies that are overlapping and I believe the maximum occupancy of each one of those classes is 52. Um, so in the cases when we're not able to fill that number, we partner with a lot of our uh, sister agencies here in the Valley. So we house Scottsdale, Chandler, Tempe, Salt River, and several other agencies that will send recruits. And also maximize that we have them send personnel, um, training personnel to help because we just can't manage that uh, that much of a lift uh, by ourselves. And fortunately, our partners here regionally are, are very helpful in that area. Yeah, so I've, I've attended lots of those graduations and watched the videos, and, and I, it's very impressive, and I, I think it's amazing. This is all really, really impressive um, data. So I just want to clarify a couple of things in my head. Um, first of all, you said that you expect unexpected. So is that just going by, I mean, you're, it's just a guess, kind of, right, but a 40% reduction, but you don't really know. So what, how, how do you base that off of? So the, when I talked about unexpected, we, we <coughs> use 20 years of historical data to set our baseline of known attrition. Everything from the academy attrition through known retirements and the average attrition that we receive every year. So we come up with that baseline number. The uh, unexpected ones are those that resign, are terminated, retire early, um, those we can't always anticipate. And so we average those over the year, and that's where we came up with a number of 25 to 26 per year. Okay. We saw a significant increase over the last two fiscal years, which is not uh, uh, out of the uh, ordinary because of what we saw nationally. Um, and so we experienced that same amount of unexpected loss, maybe it's lower than some of our uh, larger cities across the country. And so what we're seeing this year is that a 40% reduction in those unexpected uh, uh, losses. Um, so that's, is, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just still kind of stuck on the expect the unexpected because yeah, you don't know. But yeah, we don't yeah. know. It could be a medical retirement. Yeah. it could be just. But we just, just, statistically, statistically try to put a number on it. Just because the last two years have been higher, and right. so I've just wondered if is that getting better? Like just the you know just the overall feel of police in the community and stuff. So and, is that? And Councilmember Spilsbury, I do believe that that's the case. Um, I mentioned briefly just a couple of the retention programs that we have, including some of the incentives that were approved by council and city management as one of the reasons to retain some of those more senior employees longer uh, and not experience that loss of those that were retiring early. Um, and so this year alone, uh, at this point, we are seeing a reduction in those unexpected losses. Um, we certainly believe that's uh, a contributing factor is those retention programs that the city has supported uh, over this past uh, uh, fiscal year. Okay, and then um, I, I just keep hearing one line that's making me wonder. So we're overhired on what is budgeted. So is the number that's budgeted also the number that ideally is needed? Is we that shouldn't use the. the Let's use the word authorized. Those overhires are in a budget. There's a dollar amount for them. Right. But so even the word authorized, like w what we've decided as a city we're willing to spend. So I'm just wondering if like we, sh that's, I don't know. I don't know if what I'm asking makes sense. As a police department, you're feeling confident with how many people and how much money you're getting to, to get those people for the community. Council Motor Spillsbury, I, I can answer that question from my perspective, is the numbers for our authorized strength are based on the demand for police services in okay. the city. And so what this program and the funds allow us is to hire above that number to ensure that we are at that baseline number in uh, the next fiscal year of 850 sworn. Okay. And I guess that is the number that we believe currently is needed um, for, for us to respond to uh, appropriately to police. Yeah. So and the, the, the city's chief cost, I, yeah. I, That's a question for chief costs is, you know, the number of, assuming the authorized positions which we're trying to get to, yeah. is that going to, you know, I'll use more, but is that meeting <laughs> the needs of, of the department as you see out to the future? Yeah, it, Mayor and Council Member Spilsbury, it, it absolutely is. We're, we are constantly analyzing data. We're working with our performance excellence folks um, to look at that data even outside of our department. Uh, there's chiefs at the table that have been working on that for two years. You talk about the deployment model. And the growth of the city, especially especially in the in the southeast and northeast portion of our right. cities, um, you know, anticipating the opening of the northeast station and what we're doing to allocate resources for that station. I mean, that is an everyday um, detail that we're doing. Um, the the promotions that we're making, the things that we're doing, are all to line up those resources and make sure they're in the right places. Knowing and factoring in that 20 years of data of the people that we know just know nutrition, and we're also talking about academy classes. Right. The city was growing quite a bit in the early 90s and, and um, mid 90s to early 2000s. So what you're seeing now is a, is a lot of folks that are naturally um, leaving the department and some are leaving drop early and some aren't, but we can statistically look at that and work with the city and, and do our projections and do uh, a predictive analysis to know that we're gonna have enough officers to make sure that we are covering and providing the level of service that we need to do. That is a daily duty that we're doing as we as we go towards the, the, the uh, fifth substation, as we look to expand our, our support personnel, our civilian staff, and we look to expand the support detectives and in in the, those positions to do that, that's absolutely what we're working on. Okay, and that's obviously just what I'm getting at, that um, as a council, are we, are we providing the support that you need? Because obviously public safety is so crucial to our community and well-being, and I think you guys do an amazing, amazing job. We have so much to be proud of in our we're, city. We're very fortunate to have that level of support from mayor, council, and city management, so. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. I think that's my questioning of, it seems like the next decade, it, there is, how can I say that? A lot of the police officers that I've talked uh, to have like 20 years, right, uh, of service. So, um, and so within the next decade, I, you all follow the, that stat, those stats that we have s a lot more officers. I think that's the same question for fire afterwards. Is there's there's a, a, bo a, a lot a lot of officers that started in the 90s, right, and now emerging into that retirement uh, uh, years. And so my fear is for us to make all these gains and, and have this, this huge kind of drop off, right? 
as far as the next uh, 10 years and really have a net of, as we grow in size as a city, it, it, there's no added net for what we're seeing now, right? It's because that all that attrition. Vice Mayor Hedry, I'd like to take a stab at sure. answering that for you, but what you just described is exactly what is factored into these projections sure. for hiring. So not only is it uh, the known uh, uh, numbers that we talked about, that includes these larger numbers of people that we know are going to be retiring because of where they're at. So every six months we're looking at this data to adjust our hiring uh, forecast to not only maintain uh, that sworn number, but to bring in those into the pipeline so we're able to stay at those authorized numbers. So we are looking at that data very carefully uh, and routinely making adjustments based on exactly that. So really, when uh, you know, I, I was at a conference last year and we were talking about this very same thing, other cities are just kind of waiting for it to happen. And then they're dealing with it while going to council or going to their uh, city management to try to get uh, funds to do that. We are way ahead of the curve in that because we're factoring those into our overall projections and requests for um, personnel. Uh, so certainly uh, regionally and across the country, there is uh, a limited or I should say challenges with recruiting uh, qualified individuals that want to be in this profession. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that has limited uh, some of our ability to uh, reach our benchmark goals with uh, with recruits. But I am now starting to see about an 18 to a 20 percent increase of applicants coming to our our hiring portals uh, just within the last year. So it's encouraging uh, bo on both fronts that we're, we're starting to see more people interested in the career field of, of law enforcement. And my other question is, when you look at sworn and non-sworn, I know in the past looking at kind of uh, the, the, the type of positions and, and kind of innovating, potentially looking at traffic and looking at if, if there's uh, support staff that can be added to ease the, the sworn officers. Is that still the case that we're looking at on how we can help support the infrastructure of staff, right, along? Uh, and I don't know if, I, I don't see it coming, but uh, maybe with some of the downtown ambassadors, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, like, how do we, how, how are we looking at that balance of uh, the changing kind of nature of these uh, the data and the crimes and, and balancing kind of sworn and non-sworn and, and f figuring out what's the best, best case, both budgetary, but also, uh, you know, fighting crime, um, to, to look at these programs or these, these, uh, accidents or just the different components that you all work on a day-to-day -day basis to make it, make us even better on helping our residents, right, um, deal with, you know, the issues that come up when they call PD, right, so. Yeah, Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's a, it's a really good question. And like built in our staffing model is not only the, the, the um, professional staff programs we have now that augment what the officers do, but what does that look like as far as growth? And the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about the growth of the downtown district and the commitment, um, you know, with the approval of council and the resources we want to put down there that aren't not sworn officers, but will will supplement and will add to uh, the level of service that you see, and that extends to our police service officers that are um, uh, traffic investigators, our civilian investigative uh, specialists who take burglary reports and do reports and do investigations that officers used to do, the expansion of, of them as well, and then um, our investment in the succession of all of those positions, both this on the civilian side and the sworn side, because when you talk about this void that we know is coming, um, succession is a big part of that. And you'll see part of the later presentation, a few slides from now, how we're gonna, how we're gonna attack succession and how we're attacking, I should say, in the current level of what we're doing and, and the recruitment of all of those positions is critical in the investment that we put in that. So certainly the civilian level positions to ease the level of uh, uh, work that our officers have to do to free them up and, and, and we haven't even touched on the mental health side and the investment that the city has done on responding to mental health calls and um, including that and, and 3,500 plus calls a year that officers don't have to go on in the expansion of that down the road as well and the support. So there, there's a lot going on uh, on our civilian side to ease that burden on the officers. Mr. Freeman. 
Thank you, Chief, uh, for the presentation. I know we're not done yet. However, I, I think you get the feeling we're 100% behind you, right? <laughs> so I've, I've got a couple of questions that are more in the weed uh, weeds here. But when we talk about the drop, you have personnel in the drop. What's the average length of time that officers stay in the drop, and do they maximize the five years? So I don't have that exact number, uh, Councilmember Freeman. I believe it's roughly four years, right around that four-year mark. Is, is that? Let me look, let's look at I, Sam. I, Sam, do you yeah. know the answer to that? I, two and a half. I, I can tell you the answer, yeah. We, we lose about a third of the people in the first year, a third in the second year. Um, and then if people generally stay past the third year, they go the entirety of it. Uh, but about 66% of our members by year three retire even after entering drop. So about two and a half years. And they have the option to go to seven years. Right. So my next question was now with the drop extension of two years, do we, it doesn't sound like we have officers uh, utilizing the two year option to stay on board or we do? Yeah, uh, uh, Council Member Freeman, we are seeing people opt in and um, and showing the intention of staying the 84 months, especially at the officer and the sergeant level, which is um, which is a big deal for us. So it's too early to tell data-wise whether that 66% is going to decrease and we're going to be able to retain because of the 84 months, but we are seeing our officers opt into that okay. and supported by city management. Well, I think that's very, very important for the integrity of the department, just having you know your senior leadership in those positions to help. Correct. Uh, the others and, and I'm going to ask this for, for both police and fire but as you consider is there I use the word incentives for uh, all public safety personnel to retain and you know keep them working here are there are other incentives not only the health side but are there other things that you could maybe consider for well, retention of I, personnel I, I can't think of a bigger incentive than that health incentive uh, that, well, that, that is that, massive it mm -hmm. is very expensive um, the liability to the city will be tremendous. We'll have a huge financial commitment. It's unlike any uh, offer that any community does. Um, so for us to, that's what allows us to extend and encourage the incentive for officers to stay longer, uh, to meet the requirements for that incentive, but which gives them then a lifetime health benefit. So. I think, I know, Chief, you've talked about that a little bit. Is that, is that starting to resonate with some of the officers? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, council Member Freeman and the entire council and mayor, um, it does resonate with our officers. Um, our young officers understand it. Um, they can see the monetary and the, the significant um, investment from the city. When you just talk to them, they understand that, that, that it, it's, it's a very big deal. I was just with some folks in a conference in Houston and they were commenting from all over the country, commenting on our medical for life and asking a lot of questions about it. And um, it certainly has a hold of our members in, um, in a great way. And they feel appreciated with that. And it's a, it's a huge retention tool. I can't overstate it. Okay. I would say that is probably the most significant incentive that we've done for um, longevity. But really our challenge, and mostly on the fire side, it's also on the police side, it frankly is getting officers and firemen to show up, right? Um, and, and being careful that we can keep the daily sta staffing. And so um, we're working very hard on creating incentives on showing up, right? And how you use sick leave and trying to make sure that there's incentives for um, perfect attendance or at least, you know, attendance. Hmm. And so that is because that's the pressure we face. It's not just the immediate pressure we have is just getting officers to sh you know show up on weekends to show up on you know their sh their their scheduled mm -hmm. shifts because that's what these men and women spend a lot of their time doing is just trying to keep that those um, days and those shifts full mm -hmm. and we do it's the same thing on fire um, so that's probably our most immediate um, challenge obviously the longevity and hoping getting people to stay longer is a, a longer term but frankly, the day-to-day -day, uh, getting people to show up and creating those incentives not to um, utilize their sick leave or their vacation um, you know, excessively <laughs> um, and trying to make it manageable within the system. Those are our biggest challenges. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Duff? Thanks. Regarding the, the lifetime um, health benefits, do the other metropolitan cities offer that or are we the only one? I was just curious. 
<laughs> well, you know one example. They, they don't have it. They don't. They don't have it in Phoenix. No, I, I, do we know, there's, there was. Some larger cities, like city of Boston. Boston. But in, in the metropolitan area. In the metropolitan area. I, I, I don't think we're aware of anybody else. Oh, well, that's significant. Thank it, you. It was intended to be, uh, separate us from everybody else. It's been around for decades, our insurance. Well, but it, it was terminated though, right? It was suspended. Well, for some it was. Yes. Some of you are benefiting from it still today, I yes. All right, thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Did you change the slide? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, uh, this is a program that uh, definitely falls in line with what Chief Cost just spoke about with looking ahead and trying to solve for issues that we know will be issues in the future but that aren't necessarily issues now. So about a year ago he came to me uh, and started talking about the growth in our downtown area and clearly, you know, as an outsider, um, we can look at the, uh, the downtown area and see the influx of businesses and the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested there. Um, and then the people coming to our downtown area and the restaurants and all the wonderful things that are occurring. Uh, but with that, it also creates some opportunities. So we started discussing how we can, how we can maximize uh, the impact that we make in policing in the downtown area. Um, and we came up with this, uh, what we're calling right now, the Downtown Ambassador Program. What this program is, is eight part-time non-benefited, likely retired sworn police officers that are no longer sworn um, that, that work in the downtown area, and they're really liaisons. Uh, the intent is to provide a highly visible presence uh, to deter crime and provide safety. Um, as designed right now, they would be working early in the mornings and later in the afternoons throughout the day. They would supplement our bike units, they would supplement our patrol officers, they would be embedded with the police department and be in immediate contact through a police radio, working with the men and women of the Mesa Police Department side by side to uh, help with whatever issues arise. Uh, they also would provide critical resources and referrals to the community. Uh, members of the community, people living in our community, business owners in the community, um, and also city employees as we are heavily in the, in the downtown area. Certainly they're gonna assist with quality of life issues. And then really what, um, what we've talked about is they're, they're the glue. They're the glue between all of the NGOs, all of the nonprofits, everybody that's out there that has a vested interest in the downtown area and providing services to people that need services and providing help. They will be the, the, the conduit that ensures that everybody stays connected. Um, what we currently see is a lot of turnover with, with a lot of the partner, the partner entities outside of the city of Mesa. And these are the individuals that would be maintained and stay in that area. Now this area, I talked about the downtown area, uh, but it's not just the downtown area. This program, uh, we also see a need in our parks. Um, so right now with this program, we're going to see how much of an impact we can make in the closest part to the downtown area, which is Pioneer Park. So as part of this, we'll, you know, these individuals <coughs> primarily be walking in the downtown area, but we also have budgeted a, a golf cart, um, Mr. Brady's idea, actually a good one. Um, so, um, well, that's a good question. Maybe we can do fire to, to support the fire department. So. <laughs> Um, so they'll also be performing the same type of services and connectivity in the uh, Pioneer Park area. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Pillsbury. So what is the perimeter that you're saying for downtown? So as designed right now, it would be right along the Main Street Corridor, Country Club to Pioneer Park area, uh, First Streets to First Avenues. Um, in the event that we see the need that there's an expansion of that, we can start expanding there where they would go in those areas. Um, this will supplement a downtown bikes district. You guys saw that we had public safety sales tax positions allocated. Uh, what we've chosen to organizationally is take four of those positions and, and expand our downtown bikes area. So we're investing heavily into the safety of the downtown area. And will they be dressed like security guards or visibly look like police officers? I, I, I have some ideas how they would look. Um, I wish I would have brought some pictures of examples that we've looked up, but uh, essentially it would say, you know, Mesa Police Ambassador. Uh, they would have bright, brighter colored clothing, think blues uh, or, or yellows um, to, to ensure that they're visibly seen. Uh, how we have it sorted now is in the wintertime, there's a jacket that would have that same clothing style in it. 
uh, but then it would be a polo shirt during the during the daytime. And so you said mostly morning and and late afternoon or whatever. But will there be someone throughout the day too? Yeah, we'll we'll always have somebody with we'll some overlap. Efforts. What we're looking right now with this program is establishing it, proving the concept, ensuring that it works, and then we can expand okay. coverage as we go. But the initial concept is as the city is waking up in the morning, those members would be out. Um, doing what they do, interacting with the community, meeting business owners, meeting other members that, are, other people in our community that are in the downtown area and making contact. And then as the city's wrapping up in the afternoons, we would have that same group of people, different people, but same positions um, out there doing the same thing. So as it goes along, we'll evaluate through statistics uh, the impact, the efficacy of the program, and then if we need to, we can come back to city management and talk about expansion or even an increase about in hours of, for these individuals. Okay, so I mean, I've, I've met with um, Nancy with the DMA. I've actually met with their board. Is she here? Yeah, yes. she is here. So I think, yeah, so, uh, and so Nancy can collaborate this. We've talked to her about this program and how we're planning on deploying it, and so we'll continue to work with Nancy and her businesses, but that's kind of the initial idea is in the mornings, we have a lot of more activity. It's an opportunity for them to um, identify individuals who may be unsheltered that are in front of businesses. So we think we'll, we're gonna try this for now and then we'll um, evaluate it with Nancy as we go forward. Okay, I mean, I think it sounds like a great idea. You, you see and hear comments a lot about uh, feeling kind of unsafe in downtown sometimes or whatever at different times. So I think it could have a huge impact and um, be a really great program. So it'll be interesting to see how it works. Thank you, Council Member. Yes, Ms. Duff. I'll, I'll talk with DMA more about this program, but would are these ambassadors the point of contact for the business owners? Or what's Traditionally, you said just call the police when you open up the business and there's a situation or you're closing and there's a situation or whatever. So would the point of contact still go to the dispatch or would it go to the ambassador? Those, those are some of the logistical things that will work out. So we're currently in process of developing the, the policy um, and, and the training on how they would operate. But the in concept, they would develop such a good relationship with the business owners that they would have the business owners would feel comfortable just to reach out to them and then they can liaison with what other services certainly if there's a crime in progress um, those aren't the individuals that that they would be no, calling no, but if but there's more of a societal reasons. issue that's occurring um, that's that's a great place to start for our business owners great thank you Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. So in the last few slides, we really talked about uh, enhancement of the service delivery model as it relates to sworn, non-sworn, and of course, the ambassador program. But what I want to do now is really talk about technology once again as a force multiplier. The following proposal represents a summary of the closed circuit television enhancements that will continue to aid in the prevention, detection, and prosecution of criminal offenses that occur within our public spaces. Although the attached graph depicts the downtown Mesa project, the CCTV technology project extends well beyond the downtown area. To increase the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the coverage of the real-time crime center, 20 strategic hotspot locations were selected based on data from 2020 through 2022. This will expand CCT coverage to areas that currently have no coverage. Since the inception of the Real-Time Crime Center in May 2022, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, the technology has been instrumental in solving, at least in part, 13 homicides and countless other crimes. The CCT enhancement proposal will continue to build on the Mesa Police Department's ability to identify and remove violent offenders from our community. Ms. Duff. Um, regarding the cameras, I've had several requests um, from downtown business owners to have some in parking lots. There's a concern, especially when employees are closing and it's late and such, to have them. And is this part of the areas that will be covered? Within the downtown area, we're looking to add an additional 43 oh. CCTV okay, cameras. Just a couple. So that will uh, line the main street from uh, Country Club to Mesa Drive. 
then we'll have a broader perimeter that will take us to uh, both the university down to Broadway. So <coughs> we will have uh, ultimately um, decisions to make as we look for the placement of those cameras. But if issues are occurring within those parking lots, certainly that will be a consideration at the time that the cameras are placed. And I'm sure DMA would be the point, <coughs> Recom right. those recommendations. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, back to talking about people again. Um, I want to highlight just a couple of these uh, positions real quick before I move on to the larger one, and, and that is the addition of full-time non-sworn positions into our, our records division. The chief talked earlier about the uh, efficiency and transparency to our community, and these are ads that will help with that, especially related to public records requests and things that our community uh, really demands of us and, and that we support. Um, one of the things that we did uh, last year is we looked at the challenges with recruitment. And traditionally, uh, I think we did a very good job with recruitment with our, uh, the videos that we put out, but we uh, embarked upon a pretty uh, aggressive digital uh, marketing campaign. Um, that's gonna continue. Uh, I wanted to share with you just a 30 second clip of, of some of our most recent uh, uh, recruitment videos if technology will work with us today, which it looks like it will. I don't want to have a plug about DOIT versus PDIT, so we'll leave that here. The three pillars of the Mesa Police Department engage with the community, relentlessly and professionally fight crime. And then the third is the pride of being a police officer and the pride of being a public servant. It's the city of Mesa, the way they do business in all the departments has always been progressive. It's always been community oriented. When you combine that with young, good, fresh ideas, that's when you go to a different level as an organization. So one of the things that uh, I think differentiates the city of Mesa and our department from others, even regionally, um, is really a progressive, modern uh, digital marketing platform. We are seeing increases of people being driven uh, to our hiring website. Uh, well, surprisingly enough, we do have about 35 to 40 percent are here in the Phoenix metro area, but we're seeing a significant increase of interest from the Los Angeles area, from Chicago, from Houston, from Dallas that are being driven to that through paid uh, digital ads as well. Uh, so we'll continue to add to that this year. We're also adding uh, more content for our professional staff positions, including detention, and especially in our public safety communications area where we are seeing uh, significant, significant vacancies in those areas. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is the chief mentioned some, uh, a little bit about our secession planning and uh, there were some questions about wellness. Um, last year, uh, uh, council and city management supported the addition of a, of a police psychologist uh, to be added to our peer team. Uh, we are actively in the recruitment process for that position uh, at the moment. We also moved a sergeant position into our wellness area uh, to actually supervise the overall wellness and career development of all of our employees, both sworn and, and, and non-sworn. In this particular budget request, we're asking for two senior program um, uh, assistants who will manage two separate programs underneath the overall wellness and career development of our employees. The first one is really our mentorship program. And again, I, I want to mention one thing that it's employee fo focused. And so the idea is you have this individual that will come in and train internal employees in all different areas. So if you have someone that's in a, a professional staff environment, it's probably better to have someone in that environment that can speak to the issues uh, that he or she may deal with as their mentor. And this is designed to meet with the employee from the time of hire throughout their career um, to provide that overall mentorship. One of the things that we hear from our employees that come in is the reason why they selected Mesa over other cities is because of the contact. 
So as they went into the hiring process, this takes several months to complete, we actually have individuals in our hiring and re uh, recruiting area that will start to reach out to those individuals uh, that have applied and start walking them through the process. They're telling us as they come in through the door is that that was why they chose Mesa, because they felt like they just weren't a number. And this, pro this program is, is part of that process to advance it, not only for our initial employees, but as they go out throughout their career. The second is really career development. Um, and that's where we take a look internally at how do we help our current employees not only develop in their own particular areas, because we do believe not everyone wants to be a supervisor. And so you can be an informal leader in your particular area and we really have to look at how we manage developing people's careers and also leadership opportunities either at a supervisor level from first line supervisors through executive positions and this program again is employee focused to bring in training and also bring in that one-on-one -on -one contact with people to help them throughout their career with an individual whose focus is on their overall career development the overall goals of both of these positions are to promote the overall wellness of our organization and not just to focus on sworn position to implement career-long mentorship for our employees encourage career and leadership development across all areas and increase retention of our current senior employees. Any questions about that? Comment. Um, I do hope we get that position filled quickly that we, um, that we have already approved. I met with Chief Cost about this issue. It's um, something that I really feel strongly about and um, I, I really, really do appreciate the emphasis that Chief Cost has for this wellness area for um, physical and mental health for, for our officers. I mean, all of those that work in the police department. So I just want to make it really clear in, in this position that I, and this goes for fire too, we just have to, have to, have to make sure that our um, officers and our firefighters are getting the support they need. And I, I would love to see it preemptively and after something happens, right? Like, I don't think we need to wait till something happens to get them the help that they need. I just want to make sure it's really, really surrounding them and everything. And it sounds like the ones starting off are a lot more um, supported and open to getting help than maybe some of you older guys that think it's too, you know, tough guy, right? T whatever. <laughs> so we, we know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But so I, I see a big change in just society, right? That like a 20 year old's more likely to seek for help than a 40 year old. We, we know this is true. So everyone's laughing because it's true. But um, yeah. Too far, far. <laughs> But no, I just, I think we've, we've got to make sure, I mean, these are, these are our heroes in our community. These are our public servants that are putting your life on the line for our community. And we got to make sure that you're taken care of and that your families are taken care of because you're doing such a huge sacrifice for us. So I just want to make that really loud and clear. And, and to your point, Councilmember Spilsbury, we have made great strides in this particular area. I mean, the four of us in uniform in uh, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Nesbitt behind us, we're old. And when we started, when, all right, well, Dan, okay, we'll leave out of this, but uh, when we started, the programs that are in place today did not exist. And, and what we're seeing is not only with the increase of programs, not just when there's a crisis moment, but also prior to in the acceptance. And, you know, whereas when we started, it was signed, it looked as a sign of weakness, potentially, if you sought out that type of help. And we're seeing a 180 degree change with that from the perspective of all of our officers. Now there's still challenges there, but the goal with some of these programs, including some of our wellness programs, is to make them more resilient when and if there is a crisis moment where they're not needing those mental health resources down the road. So it really is both before and after a potential critical incident. And I, I do think so much of that culture change has to come from the top. And so I, I very much appreciate our, our chiefs in, in um, fire and police that are making this a priority and making it acceptable to get help and, and, that it, and that it is such a priority for you. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Redia and then Ms. Dahl. Right. <laughs> um, these, uh, on the records management, I know in the past we've had long backlogs on records. I heard from re residents that even getting a, you know, a, something that got stolen or, or a traffic uh, incident, trying to get it to insurance, taking you know, months to get information, information from PD. So is that a more uh, like a personnel issue or just a, the software that we're using or a combination of both? Uh, so that might be my first question. And then I'll, I'll ask 
other question. That would be good. One at a time. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Heredia, uh, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager. Uh, we are working very diligently in enhancing the personnel in our records unit, and we do have high turnover. And we have even kind of streamlined our training so that we can get people to be doing the actual job sooner. So this additional seven personnel will add to the capacity for us to staff our floor, which will then allow us to start staffing the public records unit and the quality assurance unit. So right now we're about at 10 weeks turnaround for a public records request. When we started um, doing overtime and even taking our transitional personnel and putting them, we have been putting them in those units to utilize them to help offset this uh, public records request issue that we have. We have seen a significant turnaround. We were at something like 52 weeks for what we'll call paper requests, right? We don't actually, there's not actually paper anymore, but you know what I mean when I say that. So um, that is what this will help support. And we do have goals of getting to what's considered reasonable. By Arizona revised statute, it just says reasonable. Well, our counterparts in Phoenix and Chandler and those places, it's based on size. So like Phoenix is sitting at years of backlog. Right, and then you'll have someone like Chandler or maybe Tempe or Gilbert that is a lot smaller and they don't have as many requests. And so we have all of those type of things that we're considering uh, in improving our response. So we do have a goal to get down to that four week turnaround. That's what we hope on the, what I'll call paper. The other challenge we have is related to our um, digital media, right? So we've now had Axon cameras on our streets for 10 years it's been, right? So um, with that being said, we now have something like 669 Axon cameras on the street. And that causes a backlog for that. So if I'm being honest, I will say that that is not necessarily improved yet, but we are always working towards, to your point, is there technology out there that we can utilize that can help offset the amount of hours that goes into redacting, uh, legally redacting an Axon video? and um, even our digital communications related to 911 and you know, call taking. So. Okay. so software, as far as the records, do we use a software, has that improved as far as a software that can streamline that process better? So Are performance we at excellence that? along with our analysts have, we have vetted software. We do have a software that sure. kind of helps that, but we have yet to find the technology that could fully do it that would be cost effective as well as time effective. So what we have found with some of the softwares out there that do some uh, digital reduction, we have to touch it on the front end, we have to touch it on the back end, then we're paying exorbitant fees in the middle. So we're not really, the analysis says we're not really saving any time. So our software in that capacity or like digitizing it completely where you don't have human, much human involvement isn't there yet. There. But we definitely look at those resources and we are definitely working towards those things. And there's legislation now out um, that we're hoping will help us um, offset some costs, which might allow us to either reduce the number of requests or have resources to get funding to um, have more personnel or better resources. Perfect. All right. Thank you. And then my other question, going back to, I echo the thoughts of Councilmember Spursbury on making sure that wellness is is a priority. Um, but getting back to your old being old, uh, Chief Wessing, um, I know a lot of the, you know, the supervisors and, um, you know, you, you all have a lot of years in, in the force. And so the intentionality of, of, uh, of bringing up other, other police officers that do want to become supervisors or what, what kind of pipelines are there for that and, uh, and identifying people early on to, you know, take extra training or you know, motivate, mobilizing them to uh, see if uh, that's this is kind of a route. Uh, I, I think you alluded to some of that programming, but is there more intentional now, as as, as I, you know, mentioned this old factor, but you know, it's serious because I think that's. That's uh, an important uh, how we uh, create in, uh, keep institutional knowledge right uh, as they as they uh, uh, grow into these positions that are you know hard positions to to be at as, as you understand so 
Vice Mayor, uh, that's actually a really good question. And, and one of the, these two programs that we just talked about are to actually formalize what we do now informally. Uh, one of the things that Chief Koss has asked us to do over the last several years is do exactly that, is shoulder tap those individuals and encourage them who may not see themselves uh, as, a, as a successful leader or may have doubt in their own ability, and then we work to mentor those individuals and encourage them. And we've seen success, particularly at the first level supervisor uh, ranks of sergeant, of getting people into the process uh, so they can learn how to take the examination and then be successful afterwards. Um, so, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, our focus on uh, leadership was primarily at commander and above levels. And what our direction has been over the past couple of years is start to focus that on our next future generation of leaders. And that's our sergeant center lieutenant. So when we're investing our training dollars into leadership uh, development programs specifically for sergeants and lieutenants, because there's a time when the five of us here won't be here, they're our next leaders to step up. And so we have really done a, a significant change at directing those funds at our future leadership uh, uh, of the organization. And Chief, you may want to add to that. With that. Uh, one example, Vice Mayor, is it, we, we partner with uh, uh, Maricopa County uh, Colleges and Chandler Gilbert. And uh, what we're doing now is being emulated on the west side and they've taken our, our model. But it is essentially a, a, a several week program um, taught by professors and also taught by our, some of our leadership and, and other police leaders around the valley. And it's a baseline leadership school um, that is college credit that our officers are going to. Um, all, they can either be interested in promotion or not interested in promotion, but we'll send them there. They'll have duty time to do that. They go as a cohort, if you will, uh, with other officers. And it gives them that, a good baseline education on what they're stepping into and giving them some basic leadership skills before they even decide to test for sergeant. And eventually what we wanna do is create that program where that is a prerequisite, if you will, to go and have some baseline training in that before, before you uh, take that next step. But the feedback that we've gotten from participants, and it's not just sworn supervisors, it's our sworn and professional staff that attend those trainings at that very baseline is very, very positive. So we're just looking to expand that program. It's, it's been laid out. Um, we've been at it now, Chief Rankin, for at least two years, um, full two years, and uh, it's really going well. So you take that and you take our investment in our first line supervisors and a significant investment in the folks that'll be the, the mid managers and the next level uh, commanders and assistant chiefs. Uh, we poured a lot of resources into that because we can see exactly what that effect's gonna be down the road. You know, before you leave that topic, can you, Chief, uh, just comment on, on uh, commitment to diversity and, and recruitment and leadership succession? Is, is that, I know that's something we've talked about and I know you're committed to, but I'd just like to make sure we, we, that that doesn't get left unsaid. Yeah, Mayor and, and uh, Vice Mayor and Council, a significant commitment to our, from our organization from the top down on diversifying our numbers. I just, I, I literally just came back from the National Association of Women's Law Enforcement Leaders in uh, Houston, Texas. And um, this morning, uh, our officers were presenting out there and there were 700 plus attendees from around the country. Um, part of that is, is um, I was on a panel to talk about the 30 by 30 initiative and our commitment and accountability to that. And that's 30% of our recruits um, by the year 2030. We're happy to report that our last academy class is 20% female. Um, so we're making strides. But just like I told a group yesterday, I mean, making up 18%, we're at 12% female right now, making up 18% by 2030 is not necessarily a failure if you don't get there. It's the commitment and, and the uh, passion that you have to get to that moment um, you know, for, for, those, for those officers and to diversify our workforce. And we know that that's very, very important to do so. Well, that, that goes well beyond just gender. Um, it goes beyond just reflecting what our community is. And you look at our last 10 years of data, and, and literally if we had a slide to put up on those two screens, you would see the city of Mesa's uh, population and you would see our recruitment. And it's almost an exact match, in, in, including exceeding in some categories, um, like our black community and some of our other categories that um, we're, we're higher percentage in our recruit than what our community represents. So we're doing well. Now the next step is where are our sergeants, where are our lieutenants, where are our, our, our leadership? Right now it's about 8% of uh, the leadership in the city of Mesa, our police department, our female leaders and, and uh, diverse candidates, right? So we're looking to increase that 
um, over the years. And having the pipeline that we've had and the numbers that we've seen over the last 10 years, we're promoting more sergeants, more lieutenants to reflect our community. And, and we're really seeing a positive uh, stride on that. But it's work in progress. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Ms. Goforth. Um, mine was back on the, the records um, item. And I, I noticed we have a, a dollar limit increase for uh, our council meeting, uh, our next council meeting. Was that increase to? What was this? I, I'm sorry. It's 4B on our council. I just wonder if it's in connection with um, helping, you know, decrease the delay in our, our records. Is that tied to this uh, dollar limit increase? That's just, well, I think that's just extending the acts on camera contract. I don't know that that's specifically. It's not necessarily no, additional no. services remember, go for it. It's creating the records. <laughs> right. Yeah. What, what, it, what it is, and it's, it's an expansion on the technology for Axon. We have those 669 cameras out, so it's, it's, it's expansion of that, uh, that program to make sure that we're up to date on that technology. But okay. to Mr. Brady's point, that the more we expand and, the, and as we're adding personnel and getting that technology for our recruits, we are adding to um, the issues that Chief Nesbitt yeah. was talking yeah, about above as far as... good we have more of the video and the transparency, but then that right. creates a records management yeah. on the back end, and that's right. the part we're trying to keep up with. Right. right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Freeman? I do, but uh, are you done with your presentation? Or you have any more? We have one more. One more, okay. and then we're done. I'll save my right. comments. It's, okay. a quick, it's a quick one. I'll make this one very brief in the interest of time. Uh, these were some budget adjustment requests and I just want to highlight really two of them. Um, you'll notice a one-time purchase of two vans for our holding center. Currently we have three that are in service. Um, right now we take two to three trips daily with 13 detained individuals down to the Maricopa County uh, Intake Center in Phoenix. Um, and with co concerns with maintenance, we often have only one that's operational, which caused significant challenges for our personnel to take uh, these detained individuals uh, down to county for uh, booking. Um, this will also help by adding to, as we move into a capital project in the next couple years to remodel the headquarters facility, we will have offsite location where we are intaking and booking individuals from uh, our patrol officers. So we'll be able to spread out those vans uh, to more appropriately uh, meet that demand that will change uh, during that capital project. Um, the second one here is the Mesa Family Advocacy Center's uh, VOCA grant. That's the Victims of Crime Act grant that actually supports um, uh, several of our uh, crime victim advocates that are placed throughout the city to provide resources to our victims. Um, as that national fund has slowly started to deplete over the last couple of years, we've been notified that, that we also have a reduction in our grant fund, which represent about 50%. And so this is a shortfall that will be evaluated every year so that we continue to have the, those critical resources for our victims uh, of crime here in Mesa. That really concludes our presentation for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Council, any additional, Mr. Freeman, did you have something? Yeah, I wanted to circle back to the uh, mental health aspect that Ms. Spillsbury brought up. You know, our employee health, not only physically and mentally, is utmost important, but however, there's a ripple effect to their family members or significant other, whomever it might be. So they, they need to know about the benefits in, entitled to them so that their support groups, not only on the policing side and their friends that you work with, but also on the family side, because that's critical for support. Because when you leave the job and you go home, what do you do? Uh, Councilman Freeman, that is a great question. We actually do have several programs to do exactly that. Within our peer team, it's not only focused on our employees, but also family needs. Um, whether it's relational needs, whether it's a uh, crisis within the family, we often have, you know, a, a potentially unexpected deaths of children. Um, our program is designed in place uh, to actually provide the same resources to their spouses and children, uh, particularly when we talk about the city's EAP program, which they receive those same benefits. There's also another program that we're looking at uh, joining um, where we actually provide family and uh, uh, employee uh, programs to help them learn to be resilient within both spiritual, physical, mental, um, and physical areas. So it's not just focused when crisis hits. Um, th that is a very critical component of our overall success because if they're not whole at home, 
we have found that over time that not only impacts their ability to work, and so we see excessive uh, um, you know, absenteeism, but also their ability to make it to this 25 year career that these new uh, police officers have to endure. Certainly we all know at, at this level that without the support and health of our family, it's extremely difficult to be successful. So that is a significant focus of those programs is family. Yeah, thank you. And I think that not only for our public safety personnel, but we have some available for our, all personnel in our city, right, Mr. Brady? Yeah. So it's available to all personnel, and, and so it's very important for the overall health of our city and every employee that we care about. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. I'll, I'll just say that I, um, looking around the country, there's very few, if any, large <coughs> cities that don't have major issues with their police departments. And so it's just, I just want to say it's remarkable, uh, the successful presentation that we've just seen and the you know the statistical uh, awards are, are wonderful but uh, I, I have to say I, I, I credit good leadership you have been very generous in in thanking the community for the financial support and and city leadership we appreciate that but uh, right back at you I, I can't tell you how admired chief cost is in our community and uh, the community outreach that you do is greatly appreciated and it reflects well on your entire department. I'm sorry, but uh, thank you. We just, I just don't want you to leave without us noticing that this is not normal to have a large city police department that is doing so well and uh, is, is not facing a lot of the challenges that we see in other cities. So thank you. Thank, thank, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mayor. This is not you a bet. party, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we don't allow clapping in city council. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All right. you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Having said that, should we take a 10-minute break? Yeah. We'll be back at, uh, at 940 to talk about our great fire department, fire and medical <laughs> Yeah, department. now you set yourself up. There you go. All right, welcome back. Um, good to have our fire department, fire and medical department with us now. Mary, and, and uh, please introduce your, uh, your leadership team, and we're looking forward to your presentation. On. Thank you, Mayor Giles. Um, Chief Cost and his team are a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> after being called old by Vice Mayor Heredia and Chief Westing, I'm they, feeling a little. <laughs> they said they're old. Okay, so they. Referring back to it. That's true. Right. But I do think this new program, the Ambassador Program, sounds like a good one for retirement. I don't know what the requirements are going to be, but that sounds like a great program for go. many of us. So. You and I both might need to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassadors. Mayor Giles, members of the council. Um, Thank you for having us today. We're looking forward to this presentation. I'd like to introduce my staff that's here. To my left is Janae Collins. She's here for Tara Acuna. Tara's out of state. Janae Collins' grandfather was the fire chief of Mesa in the late 70s through the 80s and early 90s. Chief Don Johnson is her grandpa. So her grandpa hired me 40 years ago. So I appreciate that very much. And I'll join that. There you he, go. He hired me as well. There you go, both of us. Also We're not going to go easy on you, though. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping that would give right. me a no, little something. No, no, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, next to Janae, we have Assistant Chief John Lachlan, Assistant Chief Forrest Smith, Assistant Chief Corey Hayes, uh, Assistant Chief James Nos Johnson could not be here today. So this is my staff. They do an amazing job. I'm fortunate to work with such great people and have a great team. They manage their areas exceptional. And that translates to great public, great quality service in the field. So thank, I appreciate them very much. I'd like to start by uh, thanking you, Mayor, Council, Mr. Brady, Mr. Butler, for your ongoing support of our members who are diagnosed with cancer. You have been so supportive of this. This doesn't happen across the, the state. But we've used $1.2 million in grant funding to do full body scannings over this last year. And in doing so, we, there were six of our members were diagnosed with significant cancers. They've undergone surgery or radiation to either remove or reduce their cancer. Um, we could not do this without your support. And we are so thankful that we have that support of presumptive cancer from city management and from all of you. In addition to that, the mental health support, as Councilmember Spilsbury was already alluding to, that is very, very important to us. And it means a lot to us that we have that support that we get. This job is very difficult, just like PDs. Our members are exposed to many different things every day. We run about, last year, just under 70,000 calls, which translates to 190 per day. And that means these folks are going on calls where they see and witness trauma, and they're helping on trauma, traumatic events 
on a regular basis. So the mental uh, health support that we're given is tremendous, and I, I thank you for that. We, had, uh, we have 692 members in our department, 491 are sworn, and 201 are civilians. And why I say that is because every one of them has a role to make the Mesa Fire Department, uh, Mesa Fire Medical Department a great department. All of them, we know that our operations team that does the response, our transport providers that are out there in the field as well, transporting our patient, and our dispatchers who do all of the initial work every day that faces the public. They uh, face these issues all the time, but in addition to all the work that they do, um, there's people behind the scenes doing work too in the fire department. I just briefly want to say these areas as well that make a difference in our department. Our administrative staff, our staffing that keeps the trucks and the ambulances staffed every day, our community outreach team, which is our public information, public education, social services, and our volunteers. Emergency management division, our EMS division that does all the training of our medics and EMTs, our fire maintenance division that keeps these trucks rolling on the streets in emergencies that they don't fail in response, fire prevention, our management services, which handles all the financial connections that we have, our medical billing team that makes sure we our transport uh, stays viable, our personnel and wellness division, which handles all of our hiring, our promotions, and our wellness of our employees, our planning and research division, which manages all the data that we use, and we're data driven and make sure our decisions are made with data behind it. Our resource division, we handle all of our equipment and our supplies, our technical services division, and our training and special operations that make sure our members are trained and they're safe in what we do and we're doing best practices that are out there. The reason I say this is because every one of these, every one of our men and women on this department know the mission and the purpose of this organization is to serve with care, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence. And I say this on a regular basis, ask anyone on this department what our purpose is and they will tell you and they do it without fail, and our goal is to do it every day, on every call, and with each other. So I'll start with, from there, I'll go on and go over our priorities and our <coughs> objectives. So the department priorities, number one is quality service. We know why we're here, and that's number one. Employee health and wellness, we, we take that very seriously. Our prevention, when I say prevention, it's not just fire prevention, it was prevention in falls. Our social services division, they have pull bars installed. We do fall prevention home inspections so people don't trip on rugs. All these things we prevent calls from happening. Same thing with our public education. We go out there and we educate on signs and symptoms of heart attack. So you see these things coming. You go to your doctor before you have to call 911. And then employee development. That's important in the training that we provide and the training that we do to keep our, our employees whole and informed and knowledgeable in what they're doing. Uh, opportunities, we have our transport program. Uh, we're very fortunate. Mr. Brady's been very supportive of our transport program. We just added three units to our uh, ambulances two weeks ago. It gives us a total of 15 units in the field, 11 peak and 24-hour. Uh, strength and disappear support, again, to, Ms., to Council Member Spilsbury's concern. Uh, we've, we've enhanced our peer support team. We've, we're working on a second chaplain. Our chaplains are volunteer because we want to have a lot of resources available for our members when needed. We have a full-time uh, crisis counselor on staff. It, we, she became full-time a year ago. We used to have part-time, and now we know, we know the need of it and now she's full-time. I utilize our data to the maximum. We wanna make sure that we continue to be database driven. Uh, expand our community outreach programs. Chief Smith is gonna go over some of these in his, uh, on his slides. And then our climate action plan, You know what we're doing with the clean energy initiatives and our new stations. Our new stations are lead accepted designs now. We have natural lighting in the stations. Not only is that good for um, clean initiatives, but also for a cancer abatement with the lighting and things like that. We're looking at all these areas, efficient, more efficient appliances in our stations, motion sensors, so the lights only go on when needed. Things, little things like that, that add up. Our employee wellness, that's another uh, priority and objective for us. Strategies to reduce risk of cancer. There's a lot of talk out there, and Mr. Brady even asked us about this, the PFAS. We are on the cutting edge of the research team. There's a U of A, ASU research going on on PFAS right now, and we have a member part of that group, so we're getting the latest information on what's going on with that. Focus on employee mental health. Again, we, we're, that's, that's priority to us with our peer group. And expand par partnerships and opportunities, and that's with other city departments that we'll touch on in our presentation as well. And with that, I'll, we'll start with uh, Chief Lachlan. Thank you. Before you do that, Mary, Councilmember yes. I'm only asking now just because <coughs> looking through the presentation, I don't see employee wellness brought up again. So I just wanted to, so I thank you again for having this be a priority and, and that it's so important to you because it is. Are you guys also focused on the um, preventative uh, 
preemptory mental health checks, not just after a crisis? Like, what, are, what do you do beforehand? Yes. Mayor Giles, uh, Council Member, Member, Member Spillberry and members of the Council, yes, we are are we our peer team and what they're tasked to do on a regular basis is send out resilient, we do resiliency training, but in addition to that, just send out resilient messages, things that they can just read about on a regular basis so it becomes part of our culture. The little things, the little information that they send out on what they can do to relax, what can they do if they feel like they're anxious, little messages here and there that are sent out from our peer support okay. and our crisis counselor that our members can start just learning about and knowing it's available to them. And so there, so with with um, police, they're getting like an actual clinician. So that's your crisis counselor. Yeah. That's who's there, and you already have full time. Yep. And then you already have a peer support program in place, correct? That yes. you're doing lots of lots of things with through that peer support program. Absolutely, right? the training and and we've expanded. Last year we expanded to have even more, and we have peer in different areas. So we have a peer support member from dispatch, so they can relate to what dispatch is okay. doing in all different areas of the department. And we're here for. Everybody on the department, all 690. And is members. that all voluntary? Like, is everyone just volunteer to do that, or do you? Does it? Is there any mandatory peer support? Or uh, no. Um, <clears throat> the two we have two that are run our peer support team: uh, Captain Dan, Dale Krogan and Dan Brady. But anybody that wants to be part of tier, we ask who wants to be part of that, and then they go through training and all that as well. Okay. So I it's, always wonder about the people who don't want to be a part of it and don't want to get help. So like, what are we doing for them? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, and you Can't know what? Force people, but that is very true. But I think uh, to the points that were said earlier, I think all of us as a senior staff team support behavioral health, and we encourage. And what we're doing now is we take video. Like if someone is willing to tell their story, and we've had a few people being able, to, willing to do that. I think oftentimes when they see a peer that struggled, and they tell their story and what they did, and if they should have gotten help sooner, these are things we've just done. We've just completed one about a month ago. I mean, we could tell them all day long, utilize these resources, but when, as soon as they hear it from one of their peers yeah. that this is what I've done, and in all honesty, the last one we did, I talked to him, he was willing to do it, and I talked to him afterwards, and he said he received so many phone calls about that they're struggling, and this is, and it was just, so we're using our own peer team, folks in our own department that have lived it, lived through it, and it come out of it to help our members see that this is a, an avenue they can take. I love that idea. Police, did you hear that? Are you doing that too? <laughs> <laughs> I love that because it's true. It's yeah. like you can, it's like your kids, like you can tell them a million times, but until they hear it from someone their age or, or in their position. So I, I think that's really powerful and I just, it does, it just opens up the culture to, to accept help and to know that it's a good thing. So thank you so much. You bet. We'll send you the I video. love that. You should see the video. Okay, yeah, I want to see the video. That's, okay. that's awesome. Sure. Well, and Mary, before, but before you go forward, I just want to, and while, while the, the police uh, admin, admin is here, I thank you for expanding your chaplain program. I know that that's been a big, both, both departments, and I think for a lot of uh, officers and, and firefighters, that's, you know, they, and that's peer support, and that's, uh, everyone's different, right? But a lot of folks appreciate that, uh, that aspect of what you're doing, so thank you. Thank you, Mayor Johnson. Right. And thank you, please take it away. You bet. And the, to, to the chaplain point, our chaplain, we, uh, the chaplain we're bringing on now, we have one that's wiser and one that's younger. I'm gonna stay away from the other word, <laughs> because I think that it re they will be able to resonate better with both chaplains, whichever they're more comfortable with, and we thought that was important as well. Chief Lachlan. Okay. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Just wanted to go over a few of our performance measures related to operations this morning. As you can see, we have our, our call volume chart, which we bring to you every year. Uh, we continue to see a 2 to 3% increase in call volume year to year. Obviously, we did have a little dip in 2020, but we in 2021, we, we caught right back up where we were, and we've continued to see that in our 2022 numbers as well. Um, we are a uh, busy fire department. We continue to be busy. It's a, a a vibrant city and it's growing so we're going to continue to see those uh, expected to see those those call volumes increase as we go um, obviously the blue is is our um, all of our medical calls and the red is all of our fire technical rescue and other calls that go there how's Matt mayor just I want to caution on the slide a little bit because we're looking at raw numbers each call that comes out is a number yes okay um, it, 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 what I want to caution on is it doesn't talk speak to unit utilization hours. Do, are we starting to look at that yet? Yes, we so, do. We, we have been keeping track of unit uh, UHU for some time. 
starting with our accreditation, um, we do keep track of that as well as call volume, travel times, all that. Okay. And I would like to see more of that in the future um, because just right now the overabundance of the number of calls tend to be medical. I would estimate if it's anything like my personal experience, most of those medical calls don't take very long. They're, they tend to be minor rather than critical. But even critical calls, heart attacks, for an example, or a stroke might take an hour from dispatch to treatment, transportation, turning over to the hospital, and then uh, going back in service. Whereas uh, some of the, what you're terming all hazard calls, uh, can go much longer. So where a serious medical call is a code, takes an hour for me to complete. Having been on the hazmat team for all the years, uh, a gas leak is two hours. The train derailment was all dang day. Uh, we've seen fire incidents that go multiple days. So knowing what's taking most of the time. In addition, uh, we tend to run some of these medical calls with four people. Uh, that's a pretty good number for a code. I wouldn't want to go below that. Somebody do CPR, somebody do medications. But fire calls, hazmat calls, the, the number of personnel it takes to execute a call successfully is much higher. It, we use more resources on multiple alarm fires or hazmat calls. So I want to just be careful with looking at this as a performance measure and simply just the number of calls. But personnel hours and unit utilization hours, I think, needs to be a critical component in order to make proper decisions on how we're going to allocate resources. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Duff. Um, also, do we look at number of calls per thousand per capita or, or somehow, you know, with our increasing population, we're having increasing calls, but I don't know if we're, you know, per thousand residents, uh, with, are we increasing or deep? It's hard to know, you know. Generally, we, we tend to see the increase in calls is is uh, consistent with the increase in population. I don't have the exact number of calls per thousand. Um, we run about 70,000 calls and we have about 525,000 people and I think that's kind of been consistent over time, but I don't have the exact number for you today. Okay. I think he's right. I think they're Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, think that's kind of, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I, I did ahead. too. <laughs> we both just jumped in. Neither of us are supposed to do that. Nope, not. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Crawford. Well, I was just going to say, it might be important, right, because if I'm looking at a graph that's going up, 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 I'm thinking to myself, well, why? Right. I can attribute some to population, but is it commensurate with the increase in percentage of population? I don't know. That would be kind of, I think, important to, to identify. I imagine you, you all ask yourself that, too, right? I mean, right. maybe some of it's attributable to more accidents as well. We're, you know, increasing in responding to... Our right. We do keep we keep track of every call we go on. We have them all categorized, uh, um, whether they're medical or whether they're car accident or, or or what type of fire, car accidents, hazmat, technical rescue. We do have all those categorized, so we can share that all that information over time. I, I don't have that here yeah. with me today, um, but we do track that. And the call volume does track with population pretty well. We obviously have the more denser areas of West Mesa, um, where you might have a little more of the car accidents. Um, on, a, on a daily basis, but we also have the growth in Southeast and Southwest Mesa and infill in downtown. But we see all the projects in the downtown corridor also. So we do anticipate to see some uh, some growth there. Um, working with our data scientist friends, Mark, Mark Castleton and Chalet Stedman, um, they work with uh, city planning also to, to project what developments are coming in the future. And so, you know, we have, we generally know how many calls certain occupancies will generate over time, mm -hmm. whether that be a commercial or a single family neighborhood or uh, multifamily. And we can project based on planning and permitting in the future um, what we expect to see in certain areas. Um, of course, you don't know until you build that out. Yeah. But we do have some projections on that. And that's kind of how we determine our, our future stations. They're based on distance from other stations, but also on projected growth and call volumes. So this data you're seeing here underlies our whole strategy of how we've made decisions about where we're locating fire stations. Yeah. Yeah. So the, all the fire stations that are going forward are now data-driven data by their impact to, based on call volume, response time, are all driven off of the base of this data here. And I was just curious if you have city comparisons, because I think that's kind of an interesting, maybe it doesn't matter, but it's just interesting to know how we compare to other cities as far as our numbers. Yeah, I, I, 
I, mean, I don't know how that compares. I can tell you the number of fire stations we have per capita is higher than almost any city in the valley. Really? Yes. Wow. That's great. That, that goes back to, I'll just say that goes back to continued commitment in this area uh, over the past 20 years when others stopped building fire stations and Mesa was trying to find ways to leverage federal federal dollars through ARA to, to invest in that as well. But we also have to make sure that we have the proper staffing because um, the fire station doesn't put out a fire, it's personnel in it. So we have to make sure that we utilize those resources wisely and we have investment in those resources as well. Good first slide. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll go to number two. Uh, so we talk about our, our response time. And response time is call handling time. Song. No, I think it is. Uh, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Um, we talk about response time. What include, is included in our response time uh, performance measure is our uh, fire department answering time, processing time. We call turnout time, the time from when the crew is made aware of a call. We call it ENCODE to the time they leave the station and then travel time from leaving the station to on scene. At the at the address point, so we keep track of this in three different three different ways: we have a 50th percentile, a 75th percentile, and a 90th percentile. And we have the numbers to go with that here. Uh, the 90th percentile is an accreditation and NFPA standard that we that we strive for. Um, a few years ago, the consultation with city management, we thought we'd add a few more uh, metrics to that just for some more context. So the 50th percentile is what we do most of the time. 70th percentile is uh, you know. Almost all the time, the ninth percentile is those outlier. You know, we get about ninety percent. Those are some outlier calls that we have that are that's difficult to get to those. But we can see that our fiftieth percentile, um, we get there in about six minutes, and that's all all the things I talked about um, included in that six minute time. So, John, just real quick, let's say it again because you said it very well. But oh. it just this is from the time the call comes in right so till the time? the time you arrive. Yes, sir. And I was reading recently in articles, there are some fire departments that don't get out of the door in nine minutes. Okay? So the fact that this department, I mean, this is remarkable. I mean, we're, we're trying to show this data, and I guess sometimes you get lost in the data, but the story here is if you live in Mesa, from the time a call is received to the time a, a response is made, it's going to be nine minutes. Now, I know that can sound like that is a long time, I get it, but relative, there are some departments that are struggling to get the truck out the door in nine minutes, okay? So, and so this is the whole infrastructure. It's not just what's happening at the station because we focus a lot on that, that's, that's important, but it's the call takers, it's the dispatching. And right now there's a lot of discussion going on in this region about that and, and the technology that it takes and the information, but that, part of the, whether it's police or fire, is critical of how that call comes in, that someone can answer it, process and get the right information, get a fire dispatch or a police dispatch, and then get that call and get to response. So this is, um, I guess I do want to be exaggerating. I, I want to overemphasize this 90% is pretty remarkable number. And then I appreciate, John, we've tried to work through like, okay, that's nice, but you know, at least 50% of the time, you know, you can get, you're going to get this kind of service. So that's pretty good too. And it takes that nine down to six, but really three quarters of the time you can say, that's a pretty good odds that you're going to be in that three quarters of the time. You're going to have someone from the time the call's made to the time they arrive, it's going to be seven and a half minutes. So that's, I think we're getting there and remembering we're adding, how many more of these stations? Three? We have quite a few stations ready to go. They're going to be coming on board. So. Now that part of that is just keeping up with the growth and demand for calls, but we believe we're going to stay on top of it. And hopefully when all those stations are open again, we'll hopefully we'll be able to kind of bring those down a little bit more. Is, that, is there, a, I can't remember. Did you just say, is there a target? It's a, for on the 90, don't you have a, uh, six minutes? Yeah. Okay. So there's a national six, standard, national standard. Yes, you said a, six, minutes. six minutes. Okay. okay. And, um, obviously we can see there's, Pardon? Call reception on scene six minutes. That's the NFPA goal accreditation. Yeah, that. <clears throat> not gonna. I. You'd have to have. I don't know how that ever. I don't know of a city that does that unless they've got really small. That's the time the call comes in. Someone takes the call, asks you questions, goes to dis dispatch, dispatch, then call, gets the call out to the station. That's pretty remarkable. So. 
we're proud about nine. That seems unfair. I mean, because first, when the call comes in, you have to triage: is this police? Yeah. Is right. this fire? Is this mental health? Mm -hmm. And that might take a, a two-minute conversation to figure out. Right? Or, what, or what's the? What do we try to keep those at? Right? What's our goal on those? Yeah. Uh, or forest? Who? What's the goal on the? The call? That how long we're on the call? What do we try to keep it at? Yeah, we try to keep it between thirty to sixty seconds. Mm -hmm in that turnaround. So that's a quick amount of time when we're doing that's those IQAs as talk. well, where we're trying to make sure that we're asking the appropriate questions and then directing the appropriate resources. Okay. Happy Ms. National Dispatch Week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So on the response time, I know sometimes we um, work with partner cities mm -hmm. to respond. Whoever is closest is going to respond. Mm -hmm. And so when we at do these averages, is that taking into consideration uh, you know, this other cities in the average, or is this just so this is what we calls, respond to? This is all calls in Mesa, whether the first unit on scene is a Mesa or a Gilbert or a Tempe. Okay, okay. So, yes, yeah, so yeah. this is any call within the city of Mesa, first unit on scene. Yeah, I think it's a tremendous program that we work with whoever's closest. <coughs> in, uh, thank you. Sure. And, and as you can see with our with our chart, we had a, we had a, a little dip, a good dip in 2018-19. <laughs> And that was when we started implementing um, the MRs that we have. We have two MRs in service. We started implementing that in that range, as well as we did what we call our Plan 80, which is when we reallocated some resources by, by looking at the data, both um, with the, the data scientists, both in the fire department and with, um, in the city. And then um, it went up a little bit. And then you can see we had a, a little bit of improvement this year. And we believe that that is, um, that is due to the generosity of the Council on City Management, letting us put engine 222 in service slightly before the station is ready. And we were able to put that engine at station five. Very busy station, 24 hour, very busy station. Um, and even with the two units there, those are our first and second busiest units in the city right now. So what's John, what John, Chief's telling you is that even before we open up station 222, we already have yes. the staffing impact is already out there on the street. And so we've doubled them up or whatever in an area similar and so again that's the point of keep adding these stations we are we do see yeah. an impact on response time so and uh, the question was do we have you know stations planned we do have uh, station 21 we were able to open that uh, in November of 2021 and station 22 sometimes referred to as the Northeast Public Safety Facility um, is uh, scheduled to break ground very soon and that's going to be a tremendous help in that power and power road, ground road corridor where we have uh, some, some, some troubles getting there in four minutes. That's going to, to take care of a big area. Station 23 is scheduled for up in the Lehigh Crossings area. Again, a challenging area for us. And then uh, Station 24 is looking like Southeast Mesa in the 80th and Elliott area. Again, a growth area. So we're trying to keep up. Uh, our, our hope is with, uh, with Station 21 opening down in e uh, Eastmark and these uh, other facilities that we're talking about now that we'll continue to see. If not decline, at least we'll maintain our, our current performance measures no, levels. Just clarify, so I'm just trying to get where the numbers are. 22 sure. is brown and power. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's the one we broke ground on in January or something. And then 23 is down south. So, well, 23 is Lehigh. And then 24 Lindsay. is. Oh, he gets a new firehouse? Yeah. Yeah. McDowell okay. and Lindsay. McDowell and Lindsay. <laughs> By the water treatment plant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then, and then southeast. All right. And then. So we have 22, the engine company for 22. We're, I saw the budget for 23, which will be coming up. Yes. Are we planning on any more MRs to be part of this? Because I'm noticing the numbers ticking up here. So we're going to do some additional. We do have plans units. working with city management. We, again, with the, with the data numbers, um, both working with um, the city data analyst and our entire division of one person in the fire department, uh, Julie Bigler in our performance and, and research area. Uh, we do look at the, the data quite often and meet with city management quite often about where do we need MRs for infill locations. Um, we've looked at the Station 5 corridor um, and some other areas that have a high call volume where we have some facilities and we look to whether we can impact that with additional MRs. But I do, I do feel confident that in, in the future we have additional MRs. I'll give you two more slides and I'll come back. Oh. <laughs> And then the next slide is just the the, uh, the 90th percentile that we talked about. So that's my slide, sir. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. So 
I wanted to tie this conversation. So social services referrals, uh, I, th I think the behavioral health units that we are funding through ARPA dollars, correct? Mm -hmm. is working pretty closely with police. So the behavioral health incidents that are impacting police responses also impact fire responses. The idea is to try to have those behavioral health emergencies handled by behavioral health professionals, getting the right service to the right folks. It also helps PD and fire response times by taking those off of your plate and moving those to an appropriate facility because now a, a unit for EMS or fire doesn't have to respond to that. That's for behavioral health. So when I look at this number, how is fire tying into the behavioral health units? And are, is the fire department utilizing these resources as much as PD is, okay. particularly tying into the alarm rooms? Well, uh, Councilmember Summers, I'll answer that. And uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council, uh, absolutely. Part of the program as it was being developed, which is now known as the Mesa Crisis Team, is basically keeping a great number of calls off of our plates because just with the call, uh, the person who's in the call center or at least in PD communications who's accepting those calls, right there they're taking n n numerous calls off our plate. So many of those calls we'll never see. Now our also our fire crews have access to those same clinicians that are being provided by our partners through Solari, whom they work with, uh, who are identifying as the basic crisis team. So our crews have access to those individuals. So that's certainly helping us be able to make the right decisions and be able to get these patients to the appropriate care and get them the appropriate uh, facility, uh, the appropriate facility for the appropriate care. So it's a, it's a, a collaboration between us, PD, as well as uh, Amanda Freeman's group and coordinated these efforts to make sure that we're certainly trying to run the wheels off this to be able to provide the best service for our community. Yeah, the, this was highly touted at the National League of Cities. I, I think it's critical. It, this does tie to our response times and, and, you know, being efficient with our resources and most importantly, getting people the right help that they need. When you need a police officer, you need a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, same thing. If you're having a behavioral health crisis, sometimes a social crisis, it's, I'm not trained for that, right? So, so sending the right resources. Um, we had this in a public safety committee meeting. I'd, hopefully we're gonna see this again in the budget process with how we continue to fund that. I would like to see extended hours for that and continue discussions about how we move this to a, a more permanent funding in the future because I think it impacts our response times as well. Right, and, th and that's actually uh, a great segue into this. And, and again, uh, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, and City Management, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about our social services programs. Uh, and I'll give you a little background on who they are, but I tell you, every day when our employees show up for work, they're, they're living the employee value statement, right? We're looking at uh, doing business the Mesa way. You know, we're, we're looking at knowledge, respect, integrity. We're looking at what your strategic priorities are when we plan how we engage these programs and how we create our programs. And we also, of course, want to serve with care. And so these teams that we're talking about on the social services sides are our civilians as well as interns who come from NAU as well as ASU. And what they're doing is they're basically going out to these calls that you were describing where we may have an interaction with a patient and we may find, uh, and we being the, the crews that initially may find that there are some social barriers that individual has. So what those crews will do is they'll either do a referral to the social services team or the social services teams will go through our EMS charts and identify patients and people who can use their services. So we'll talk about what some of those numbers look like and what those metrics are. But one thing I did want to add is that this social services team, we couldn't do business without the collaborations of our community partners, as well as, and more, even more importantly, some of the groups that we have within the city. Uh, when we look at the homeless strategy team that's been put together, the Mesa Opioid Response Team, Mesa Nudge, Mesa Cares back when we were going through COVID. Being able to integrate with those really allows our city to be more engaged and be able to provide the best delivery of service that quite frankly we can see across, uh, uh, across the United States better than, than many uh, uh, cities across the United States. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's an iterative process, I understand, but we're starting to recognize the more directly what the needs of the community are in this area and that all these things correlate. That's right. So as as these services coalesce, I think they're going to become 
more efficient, more effective, and also uh, free up resources on PD and fireside to respond to the to the emergencies that we are, we as those professionals are best suited. So oh, absolutely, for. So this is the right direction to move. Well, I tell you what, again, in those community collaborations and and how. Uh, our city is engaging with reaching out to some of our vulnerable populations and making services available has really put us in the forefront. And, and the city of Mesa was really ahead of this back in uh, right around 2008 and 2009 when we were creating social services programs and we're working with other cities who were looking at how do we engage our fire medical departments, our fire departments in helping these vulnerable populations. And so uh, the first graph you see right here talks about some of these things that we're doing. And you'll see there, it reads uh, a 35% target. This is what we came up with when, back when we first started these, we didn't know what numbers we were gonna be working with. We didn't know what success looked like. And so when we had other departments reach out to us and say, okay, what does success look like? We pretty much landed at 35%. I say we, other agencies who were looking to say, okay, what does success look like? How do we know we're reducing calls? The 35% is, what does it look like when we're seeing somebody for the first time, uh, our crews, fire crews, see somebody first time, then we follow up with a social services intervention, then what does that patient's lifestyle look like 30 days later? So we're looking at 90, excuse me, 90 days before, 90 days after. So this chart right here depicts, again, the, the, the goal was to go to that 35%, which was somewhat arbitrary. Again, we didn't know what success looked like. And as you see, uh, there's a dip, or excuse me, a, a, a peak right there, which would be around February 22. And what that depicts is that during that time, we had, uh, now these are first time callers because one graph you're gonna see is people who've called for the first time, and then you're gonna talk about high utilizers later. But in this graph that you're seeing right here depicted, we had 81 patients who called 911 for service. And of that, they had generated 219 calls. We then followed up with the social services team again, looking for social barriers they may have, whether or not there are any issues with fall injuries uh, that we could prevent, uh, and, and, and taking a look around the home to see if we need to apply any of the programs that are available through, to us through city programs and, and uh, community resources. So again, 81 people generated 219 calls. After our visitations, we knocked those calls down to 65 calls within that period of time, which equals the 70% decrease in calls which, of course, as we talked earlier, reduces the need for us to send the crews out to them. Okay, so what you see right there is depicting just that. Uh, the next slide, thank you, is referring to uh, our referrals. Now, these are what we call crew referrals. Again, with this group, it was uh, made up of several other departments and cities where we were looking at what baseline is, what can we get from our crews. We went with a baseline of 50 referrals from crews a month. We had about 74 or 77 during a particular, uh, on an average monthly, of referrals from our crews for individuals that when our crews respond to a call, they walk in. Uh, Jim, pardon me, I think I used Mrs. Smith, or, or Mrs. Smith as an example. <laughs> but uh, they walk in and they identify that Mr. and Mrs. Smith need services. But you know how it is uh, as, as former and, and current first responders, but I would say everybody else has that family member. When you go on a call, when you go to their house, you say, wow, there's, they have little rugs, there's a little dog, there's these trip hazards. What can we do to mitigate or decrease the chance that we're gonna have to call 911? So when our crews go on these calls, they're looking around the house saying, okay, we've taken care of the emergency, but we haven't taken care of those other little things that are gonna cause them to have to call 911, and that's where social services comes in. And whether it's food insecurities, where we can work with Meals on Wheels, who get to do a daily check on folks, if these people are at risk of going homeless, then we can work with our homeless strategies team to our identifying those folks. Again, we work with other city departments as well as community partners to see what we can do to decrease the chances that this person is going to require 911 services. So these referrals I'm, I'm are going really to throw important. in dial ride services, ride choice services, so mm -hmm. that they can go shopping, go to their doctor's office, get their prescription medications. Absolutely, and I tell you, and that's where this comes in. When you look at some of the city programs that we have going on and how we've been able to work amongst other departments and collaborating to find out what those barriers are, because sometimes it's just a matter of those things, right? You've been on those calls. And so uh, that's one way to be able to decrease some of those call volumes. Uh, and again, I mentioned the referrals from the crews. We also have our uh, employees who are going through charts and saying, okay, this person looks like there's, there may be a probability that we're going to have to go out again. What can we do to initiate going out to their home, giving them a visit and finding out what needs do they have and be able to serve them there. 
And then uh, my final slide. Now this is where we talked about those high utilizers. These are the individuals that just uh, have used the 911 system three times over a 90 day period. And so again, three times within a 90 day period. The goal is to see how we can reduce those call volumes and then do an assessment 30 days after the times we started initiating those visits. So an example you'll see there, I'm gonna go back to that February period of time where we had 26 people generate 148 calls for service. 26 people, 148 calls for service. After we've gone out and done our interventions, we had reduced those calls from those same individuals down to 42, which gave us a 72% decrease in the need for uh, 911 services. So again, that gives us that opportunity to find out what the barriers are in those homes and then work with the various programs that are provided through the city as well as our nonprofits within the community to help uh, those folks have a better quality of life. So I tell you, we're extremely proud of the program and we appreciate the support we've been getting from all the, I mean, really, I shouldn't say we appreciate the support as much as we're proud to be part of the city's programs that we have to be able to provide these services, which makes our city an amazingly special place. So thank you very much. Good morning, council and mayor. Um, we're gonna go over our expenditure summary next. So you'll see on this slide, the top portion just refers to our public safety sales tax fund itself. So our year end actuals for last fiscal year were just under 10 million. And our revised budget for the current fiscal year is just over 13 million. And that did include the addition of 12 new employees for station 222, as well as some additional funding that we received for cancer screening measures for our sworn employees. Our year end estimate is 10 million. And the main driver of that large variance between the revised budget and the year end estimate is just personnel savings. So in this fund, we budget the sworn positions at topped out rates, even though the incumbents aren't necessarily at the topped out level. And along those same lines, we manually calculate over time for this fund, but those calculations are based off of the topped out position costs. So we have not only savings from the overtime, but the position costs themselves. Our proposed budget for next fiscal year is just under 15 million, and that does include the addition of 12 employees for station 223, as well as the PSPRS adjust adjustment that Krissa had mentioned during her PD presentation. So moving on to the bottom portion of the slide. Well, um, top and bottom of the incident response uh, increase there, can you allude to that piece and then the, uh, I'm not sure if we cover the uh, de depart departmental support also increased from 21 to 23, 24. What's, what's leading that, that uh, cost increase? So the cost increase from the so departmental support? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which increase are you referring to? Oh, what 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 is it as far as the increase from 18.9 to 25.6 or in the last two years or last two? Uh, she's in the next oh, section. Sorry. Right? She was up in the public safety okay. top, so that's fine. But in the top section, then the incident response, <laughs> the cost from 8.1 to 14.1. Uh, what's what's leading that? Yes. What is incident response again? So Mayor, uh, yeah. Vice Mayor Heredia, so keep in mind that the 8.1 was the actuals, not the budget. And so within this fund, because we experience those personnel savings, we typically don't ever spend the entire adopted budget or revised budget for this fund. So um, within that fund, the adopted budget was actually 11.8 million, even though we came in at the 8.1 million. So we always have or anticipate savings every year. Um, but to answer the second part of your question, incident response just particular to the public safety sales tax fund is just operations. Just operations. And Correct. she's adding in each 22, 23 and 23, 24, correct me if I'm wrong, an additional fire crew he is showing Correct. up in each one of those. It's being funded by the public safety sales tax. So the, you know, it's, we can have new, we can have all these new positions, but we've got to have the fire stations for the going. So we work on the timing of, okay, fire station projected open sometime in the future, John had those dates. And so we try to get a crew out there ahead of that time for to have the experience. So by the time we're ready to open up the fire stations for operations, the crew's been out there for 
well, at least a year or more, yeah, right? So yeah, yeah, a couple of years. So what you're seeing here is the addition of these um, recruitments for the uh, fire crews in anticipation that in the future we're going to have those fire stations for them to move into. Okay, so moving on to the bottom portion of the slide, these represent the funds outside of the public safety sales tax fund. So our year end actuals for last fiscal year were 104.5 million. The revised budget for the current fiscal year is just over 115 million. And that did include six new positions funded out of the general fund, as well as 27 positions funded by our transport program. That also includes the large grant for cancer screenings that we've received through FEMA for our sworn employees, as well as spring and fall medic school classes, fall and spring recruit academies, and then lastly, that combines all of our ongoing and one-time contingencies that we received throughout the fiscal year. For our uh, year-end estimate, we are anticipating coming in a little over budget at around 119 million. And as Chris had mentioned, um, we're experiencing some of those same things that are driving up our estimates, which would be the $2,000 payout that our employees received in January, as well as the 5.17% inflation that we got across the board for our budget. Um, we also had a large vacation payout for our employees department-wide this fiscal year. And then lastly, our overtime expenses. Our proposed budget for next fiscal year is just over 120 million. And that includes the PSPRS adjustment, as well as the budget adjust adjustment requests that were approved for next fiscal year, which will be listed on the next slide. So here's the list of our adjustment requests that were approved for next fiscal year. First are the fuel tank conversions, and Chief Camelli will be going over those in more detail on the next slide. Then we also had paramedic school. So this includes not only the addition of 11 FTE, but also the cost of running the program itself. And Chief Hayes will speak more in detail about that innovative program later in the presentation. And then lastly, were the fall and spring recruit academies. And we're planning for both of those to consist of 25 city of Mesa recruits. Can you explain this slide just a little bit more for fall and spring academies? I think 25. we're going to go into detail of each one of these, correct? Okay. So when we get to it, because you have FTE zero in the fall and spring academies for 50 people. So when you get there, would you? Okay. And then yeah, the that. ongoing cost is 58.5? Yeah. So the ongoing cost, the only thing that we build in ongoing into our academy requests are uh, uniform allowances for the brand new members. So that's the only thing ongoing. Everything else is just really the one-time cost of running each academy itself. Sherry gave you, when we were going through that chart on the top, public safety sales tax, you saw that increment. That was the, the salaries yep. of mm -hmm. these individuals that are going to come online. This is just running the academy. The cost of actually running the academy the itself. Because academies aren't okay. continuous. The salaries, the positions, and I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, just our quirky way of doing it, but we have additional positions in this budget for personnel. This is just focusing on the. Just don't think about the, the. Don't academy, think about the personnel. Think the, about the academy itself. Okay. Yeah. That that one tripped me up. Yeah. 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 So All right. Council so we're Member Summers. The way to think of it is really the academies aren't the driving force of needing additional FTE. The driving force is either opening or constructing new fire stations, or it's implementing new programs or expanding existing programs. So. In the case of constructing a new fire station, those FTE would be represented more so through the CIP or O&M process of that station itself. So two, 222 engine is last year's budget. Correct. This budget will include two, at least 12 new employees correct. in the system for 23, 223. Right. Right. And then the next. And then the next one, and then the, would the rest then be Attrition? Retirement. Retirements yes. and stuff? Oh, yep, yeah. attrition. Yeah, and then also for the medic school. Okay. The does the 4.7 include its one time, but does that include the staffing for that academy? So so it, it's not just things. It's We've got to bring a whole... Right. Yes. We have yes. usually training about six to seven <laughs> training yeah. officers for each academy. And between that and the recruit salaries themselves, that makes up the biggest cost of each of our academies. Do, do others... Cities pay into that then? Mm -hmm. 
to help if run the academy, us, right? Yeah. yeah. But this is just covering R25 or whatever you said. <laughs> exactly. That, yeah. For Mesa. Okay. Similar to what PD does, we have a, a, a process where our okay. recruits, they, they pay a specific amount to which is more facilities use, and then they support us with additional with RTOs, which people. is where the cost comes into Mr. Brady's point. Okay, the that's what I thought. Comes to and, the, and the reason we show this one as one time because we don't always have this many academies. You know, there's been years when there may only be one, or there may not be one. So we treat it as one time coming in. We budget for it, and then we we make those adjustments each year if we just need a, an academy to stand up an academy. So, similar question to what we asked PD, uh, the council members were concerned about turnover. Where are we on turnover with the fire department? I don't, don't expect it's as unstable as PD, perhaps, but. <laughs> Mayor, Council Member Summers, uh, members of the council, our turnover is not as significant. I mean, most of our members stay the 20, 25 years. We don't see as much turnover, although every year we do plan and working with OMB, they allow us to overhire because we do lose some prior to the drop or they don't go the full five years in the drop or for other reasons, medical and different things that come up. So we do lose some outside of the planning that we have for attrition. And so we, we always plan for that by overhiring for that as well. And and we do the overhiring yes. as well. Yes. Are we also considering, you mentioned we had six members diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. So those are six people who are on the list of the number of employees in the department, but they cannot work. So are we considering that in the numbers when we do the overhires? Uh, council members, numbers, yes, we do, because we wait. Um, some of them are coming back to work after their surgeries, so we can't really, but we do keep that on the list in case someone does decide to decide to take a medical retirement or something of that nature. We do keep track of them, but we see kind of where their status is after their aunties. And then for those who are fortunate enough to still be healthy to be on a truck, what are we doing for retention for those members to try to, it's the same issue, trying to keep our senior members and get them into informal or former leadership positions. Are we doing similar things with like PD to, to hold them? I mean, I know the health benefit is citywide. Correct. Are we doing other things as well? You know, we, we are doing different academies. We, for keeping, for leadership, or specific, are you turning, uh, referring to a specific leadership to keep them into succession well, or just, just anything retention? that we are doing to help with retention? Yeah. And I think uh, we're in the same boat as uh, PD is in that as well with the younger generation, but we're not losing as many. We lost a few for different career choices. But the majority of our members, when they come in the fire service, they're here to stay. And, and, and I think the healthcare benefit is a great um, What, what I hear from process. the healthcare benefit is from employees I've talked to, they are now, they don't go, have to go work a second job or they don't have to um, sign up for the National Guard or something like that. So it's been a big, it's been a life changer for many of them. The National right. Guard's gonna be so ticked. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have them working for me on the weekends. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> And, and keeping those members healthy because it's, you know, if if, uh, if if an assistant is off sick, that work can get done the next day. The, the difference with PD and fire that makes it more difficult is you have to have four personnel on a truck. You have to have a certain number of officers on the street. There's a standard for that. So it, one of my other concerns with both PD and fire is making sure we're not accessing mandatory overtime. You know, we talk about the, the behavior health aspect and PTSD aspect of the work that police and firefighters do. Well, working a 24 hour shift and then getting forced to work another one after that because we're running short is a concern. It's the same with the police officers, and I know sometimes that has to happen, but we need to minimize that. So I want to just make sure that we have the. So we're trying to have. manage that behavior by incentivizing or disincentivizing uh, overuse of sick leave any kind of leave and so we have again i mentioned before same thing for pd and um we are proposing to um the employee groups incentives for i don't know in scott do you call it perfect attendance or what is your reference on that sick leave what do you call it is it called what's your reference on the sick leave incentive on the sick leave yeah it's, uh, the perfect incentive. perfect that's what we call it. i just want to make sure i'm using yeah. the right remember that the right phrase incentive. yeah so we, we say i say it somebody else heard. so we've created the incentives for periods of time to show up 
for so the, there's not unscheduled leave i guess is the better way of saying that, that. For specific use. yeah so we're creating incentives like that so that we again as difficult as to your point as difficult yeah. it is for pd to make sure their shifts are covered it's I don't even, is there a is financial that, the, the idea for fire it's even yes. more extreme because of the minimum personnel we have to have on a on a, a crew and so we've tried to create those incentives for people to show up to work is there a financial incentive for holding on to those hours well I mean, that's what it is well no post oh you know, we are into looking retirement? into that yes <laughs> well not post retirement but we're looking at ways for them to sell back some of that yeah. leave if they accumulate it yes yeah. Yeah. those are things that are in the works mm -hmm. Councilmember Summers, uh, I'd like to address your mandatory, uh, to Mr. Brady's point, that what we're doing here is incentives to keep people coming to work. But our mandatory policy, I want to compliment our labor management group that was on the committee for that. So when we say mandatory, our mandatory, I think, and our team thinks, it's as accommodating as it can possibly be because we know people have lives on their days off and have child care, whatever it is they have. So how they organize our mandatory policy is you know ahead of time what day you will be called. So if you can't make that day for some reason, you could arrange for someone else to take your place if you want to. You give them a call and say, I can't do this day, can you cover me? So I think we make it as accommodating as we possibly can in mandatory, because we know we have to staff the vehicles. So uh, letting them know ahead of time so they can have someone else take their place if they can't do it. Because uh, we have the same concerns as a team. It's like mental health is important. And if someone needs a day off, we don't want to make you stay. You know, it's not good for anybody. So the mandatory policy that we have in place is um, accommodating as the capacity. Yeah, and, and you're very aware, having been in Florida, that they had a few firefighter suicides down there, and I'm sure the police could yes. come forward with the same stories, and mm -hmm. the fire chief in Florida said no more mandatory overtime, mm -hmm. because we're, we're overworking right. our people. For the record, I have 3,349 hours of sick on the books. <laughs> I don't call it sick. There you go. <laughs> you right. are the exception. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. Oh, let's see. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> for a whole year. I'll just. You know, hopefully, you stay healthy for sure. Um, so, just briefly, uh, on the fuel tank, uh, the 1.2 million dollars. We have a few portable fuel tanks out there that are portable tanks that we've been using as permanent fixtures at two of our stations, Station 2 and Station 9. So we want to address these right away because they are out of compliance and it's for safety reasons. Just putting in permanent tanks to have the, you know, so they're grounded in bonding and also um, making sure that they have the proper bullets around it so they're protected. So that is what that's, and then we'll be coming back in the future for a few more that we have for some future sites, possibly Station 6 and Station 7. We'll look at the data and see where the best locations are to prevent our vehicles from having to drive so far to get fuel. So that's it. Mayor, Council, uh, the next two items are mine, and I'll talk a little bit about our, our two recruit academies. So we did have a little bit of uh, discussion. Um, our, the way that we do our budgeting for our, our recruit academies is um, we don't always need to, although I will say I think for the last <laughs> five I or six that, years, <laughs> we keep trying to not have to. But it keeps rolling back at us that we're going to need two. Um, so that's what we've budgeted for this year, it, and that's 25 Mesa recruits as well as that we do partner. We are one of the one of the five regional recognized um, fire training academies uh, for the automatic aid region. So we do get partnering agencies from re really all across the, the region, and um, that includes the the station 223 staffing, which was just talked about. It includes the the hiring for the approved paramedic program that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, we also do project, similar to what PD does, we, we project for unexpected retirements using a history of the past 10 years of what we've seen. Ours are, do tend to be a little bit lower, but we do project for that, and our, our Office of uh, Management budget has been great about approving those kind of things and then helping us look at the data to make sure that we're staying on pace. Um, we've also started to have conversations similar to what uh, Councilmember Summers was referencing um, in ways to help over hire for our modified duty status. We do tend to have several employees that are unable for many reasons um, with some type of an injury to be able to work on, on their frontline fire apparatus. So we use them in other capacities to support other programs, but that does cause a vacancy that, that through the work with our, our 
um, analyst team, our, our planning and research group in, in OMB, we've, we've started to tie that in too to see what, where our numbers need to be in our hiring. So um, that's what our next two uh, recruit academies look like, 25 recruits projected in each one. And then the next program I'm gonna talk about is one that we are very, very excited about. We appreciate the support that came from, started with the city manager's office and then obviously with the council. I, I wanna explain a little bit about how, how our members have become paramedics for the past 20 plus years. And this, this, there's really two phases to this because the council supported uh, a year, year and a half ago, the Mesa Fire and Medical Department moving in the direction of kind of covering a gap which has us managing our own paramedic training. We are a, we are a training center in the state of Arizona, um, one of only three fire departments that actually has the ability to train our own paramedics. And we moved in that direction when we realized that we had a vulnerability of being dependent on other agencies as to when we could send somebody to med school, what that school was gonna look like, what the timeline impact was going to be. And, and so we moved in the direction with, with management and council support to, to start our own paramedic program. And then I can say clearly that this has been a priority for our employee group for several years. This was a, a high priority for them. They certainly were working very diligently with the, the management team to try to figure out some better ways for us to do paramedic training. So as you guys know, our, our frontline firefighters, they work a 56 hour work week. That is their scheduled work week, 56 hours a week where the normal employee may work 40 hours a week. These guys, they're, they're, their starting schedule is a 56 hour work week on average. They were then attending paramedic school 20 hours a week to sometimes 25 hours a week on top of that, on their own time. Time away from their families, time, time um, totally committed to learning to be a great paramedic and providing care in our, in our communities and in the East Valley. It's a hard, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, a couple of our council members have gone through paramedic school and they understand just how uh, draining that is to, to go through that program and how intensive it is to try, to try to, especially if you're working on a very busy fire truck for 56 hours a week. So we brought forward a plan to city management uh, about, about eight, eight or nine months ago, maybe a year ago, with the concept of transitioning our program from a one-year program, two days a week on their days off, on their own time, to uh, hiring 10 personnel, and we will actually take a 12-month program and condense it to a six-month program full-time. So we will take our firefighters off of their fire apparatus, and they will become students for six months. A portion of that will be precepting and clinical time where they're actually working that, that similar schedule, but they'll be doing hands-on skills, but the majority of that time is actually spent in a classroom mm -hmm. learning to be a paramedic in the state of Arizona. Um, this is a very, very uh, innovative program in, in that it, it allows our employees to be fully compensated while they are going to medic school, which they will then provide to our community. We think it's going to provide exceptional paramedics because they can solely focus on that versus having a full-time plus job and going to medic school on top of it. And our employees are very excited about the support. So we, we are grateful for the support that we got from the city manager's office. I know our employee group is very grateful. This is a big investment into the future. We have seen on a national level, I'm sure you guys are hearing at a lot of the meetings that you guys are attending, that there is a paramedic shortage going on in the country. Um, I, I, we've talked about it a lot. We've done a lot of research and talking about it in our industry and we certainly realize that, that with the, the pandemic, there's been a change in how hospitals um, are doing business and they are certainly, they, they've made a decision as they saw some staffing shortages to look at the ability to use paramedics in, in a broader spectrum in the hospital setting. And that's, so, so now instead of competing uh, really for paramedics just within the pre-hospital EMS system, we find ourselves competing in, with, with hospitals and, and other areas of healthcare for these paramedics. So we feel like that this is one of those ways that allows the, the Mesa Fire and Medical Department to manage our needs within our own organization. And it's a very comprehensive plan that we are excited about and our members are very grateful for. So we appreciate the support. Mr. Radio. Chief, uh, where are we at on the transition? I know we talked about the transition of the, uh, I think this goes into the, the MR units and, and uh, the uh, transition from the vendor that we have. AMR. So, AMR. Um, where are we at as far as, is there a percentage? Is it like, are we 
of or I don't know, like yeah. just trying to picture in my head, like, are we close or are we half and half or where we're at on that process? And then I have a follow up question as well. OK, Vice Mayor, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Yes, we are actually um, our public safety, your, your peers on public safety. We did a, a quick presentation for them last week. We are now at 65% of the calls. So the transports that happen out of the city of Mesa, the city of Mesa is running 65% of those with this last, this last uptick of three additional units that Chief um, referenced. We have our kind of a soft game plan as we're trying to grow strategically. We're trying to grow cautiously and strategically to make sure that we're meeting the needs and we're, we're working well with that private partner to make sure that, that they have time for, the, for our expansion to, to be less impactful for them. So 65% is where we're at. The great part about this program is our, our civilian transportation personnel are part of it. So we're hiring um, 10 personnel from the, from the suppression side to support Chief Lachlan's division, but we will also be supporting sending, we're, we're planning on four EMTs that are in our transport program will also be a part of this and they will get to become a paramedic for our, for so our transport Corey, program. clarify, those are civilian? Civilian EMTs that, that so. currently staff our, our ambulances will then have an opportunity for them to, to, to have career growth and become paramedics in our transport program. So we're very excited about it and they are too. And then any up, update on, we talked about this pilot project where we hitting uh, hot spots. Um, maybe it was like two years ago or a year and a half ago. Um, where we're at on that, lessons learned and how do we uh, imagine like that will help our, our call, res uh, call response, right, timing. Sure. Uh, especially on medical response call, calls, yes. right? So can you talk a little bit on that pilot program that we think we, we talked about, like locating commercial spaces, hitting yes. these hotspots, uh, yes, using data? Yes, yes I, uh, Vice Mayor and Mayor and Council. Well, we did conduct a pilot program. We called our, um, an LA pilot program and we did operate a two-person response vehicle out of uh, the Red Mountain PD substation, um, University and Greenfield. Uh, we ran that for about six months and we, we collected data on that and we have discontinued that, that particular pilot program, but we are still looking at ways to identify areas where we may be a little challenged in getting there in four minutes or less on a regular basis, whether that is using existing city facilities such as the PD substation or available commercial locations. And we do, we do look at the data and where we can have the most impact on that, but. We did conclude that LA pilot program. Uh, City Manager Brady has challenges to continue to bring pilot programs to him um, to you know, be innovative in how we approach the call volumes in our city. So we will continue to, to do that and bring forward other ideas um, and potentially try other ideas in, in other locations as well. But yes, we did, we did conduct that LA pilot. Yes, sir. So Vice Mayor, I think we'd all agree um, the challenge was it wasn't a two-person response, it was a six-person response. We couldn't get that figured out and so we've got to do we've got to go back and look at the protocols and how we dispatch and get comfortable when we want to just we need to just send two yeah. units um, because we weren't sending two we were sending six and so it was becoming actually very inefficient because we were sending the two person and the pumper because you know we we don't have yet in place the confidence and the ability to triage I don't know if that's the right word the calls coming in so that when we send a two person, we know that that's gonna be <coughs> adequate um, and service that. We think we need to work with our medical doctor, what's her Medical name? director, Dr. Director, um, because there are cities that are doing this yeah. across the country, and we've just gotta figure out how to make it work within our model and get our people comfortable with it, because right now um, there's a lot of pushback on that, and we, we've gotta figure out how to get more confidence in it, so. No problem. Ms. Pillsbury. On the, <laughs> yes. I just don't understand. Okay, I know. I, it's just easier to hit that one. Okay, sorry. Um, the paramedic school. I think you answered some of my questions because I was wondering, um, like, who all becomes paramedics and if civilians could become paramedics and stuff. So, I think those questions were answered. Um, I'm assuming it's kind of a scheduling nightmare because you're pulling firefighters off of their regular duty to do paramedic school, so then you gotta cover those spots and stuff. So like how many people are we thinking would be in a paramedic school and are you gonna do it at the training facility or will it be a different location? Yeah, so we are currently running a training program, Council Member Spillsbury. Uh, our, our, the, the last year was our first year that we, and we were doing it in that 10 or 11 month program. 
Um, it's, it's currently going on right now. We, we got support from the city manager's office and actually did a build out of one of the classrooms out there with some, some um, additional funding that was requested and built a, a classroom. So it, it actually sits in our training facility. Um, they have their paramedic classroom, their space. They've got mannequins and continued, uh, continuing education stuff that our EMS division had plus some stuff that we had to purchase. It's going very well. What we expect to see is, um, a, a, right now, the way we're doing it, we are technically running two cohorts. So there's 24 students in a class. We're running two of those. Because of the, the, the current schedule, we're asking these, our, our members to come on their days off. So we really run two. We, we would call it a firefighter-friendly schedule. It's a common term. A firefighter-friendly schedule means you teach the same class two days in a row. So that's how we've been running our, our current paramedic program and how we were asking some of our other partnering agencies to, to, to run programs prior to us taking this on ourselves. This is going to allow us to do a single 24 student cohort in a six month program, 40 hours a week. Um, so we will have 10 designated suppression spots in that 24 students. We will have four dedicated civilian transport positions in that and then we'll have 10 positions available for our partnering agencies. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, Gilbert sends paramedics to our program, um, Superstition Fire and Medical, Casa Grande, um, Queen Creek, Florence has had people, because there's really only three recognized training facilities um, available to deliver paramedic training within the fire departments, that's uh, Mesa, Chandler, and Phoenix, all of the regional partners are regularly seeking seats in paramedic programs. We are very confident that we will be able to fill our paramedic program continuously and, and, and keep it 24 students at a time. And um, I guess I just don't have the expertise to know this. Do, does every firefighter become a paramedic or just the ones who want to be? It's voluntary? It, it is voluntary. Pay increase? Like what's the... <laughs> yeah, Council Member Spillsbury, yes. There is a pay increase. Um, I, we've been looking at that and, and we do very well in terms of the... It's an assignment pay in, in the rank of firefighter or engineer <laughs> or captain. It's an additional assignment pay that, that they receive. Um, and it so essentially on every fire truck we, we have two paramedics and two EMTs mm -hmm. the normal fire truck a pumper or an engine that's mm -hmm. our, our, our makeup um, and then with great support from our the office of management budget we've been able to increase the number so if you look at it statistically you would think well we only need 50% of our department to be paramedics but a paramedic gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of Chief Lachlan's struggles with staffing his apparatus right so if I'm a paramedic I can fill all four of those seats on a, on a fire truck where if I'm an EMT, I really can only, from the medical perspective, only fill two seats on that fire truck. So we probably are at about 68% ALS right now. We've, we've kind of set some, some ideas and, and goals where we'd like to see our leave pool, pool which is where our rovers are, are at that staff vacancies on our trucks. We'd like to see that in that 75% ALS range. So we're continually striving to, to increase that number to, to that sweet spot where we think is gonna be about 72 or 73%. But then a lot of our paramedics are retiring. That's, that's part of our attrition that we see. You spend 30 some years on a fire truck and, and you're moving on your career and, and those medics are going with them. Whoever they I, might I, be. I would just like to add, there's a testing process for it. There's a test and an interview process to be, get in the medic program. So everybody does not automatically get there. Oh, okay. That's exactly So right. it's like, you know, it's, it's competitive. Okay. Yeah, uh, Council Member Freeman, yeah, it, it is to that point. It is a testing process that's applied for. They come in and they take a, a, um, a, a medical, what we would call that BLS test to, to say that they are meet the minimum qualification. There's also some components to this that we, we review and that tie into the writing and math skills as a minimum standard because when we built our own um, training center, there are we do receive college credits for, for the program. Our students get about um, 41, Chief? I think 41 credit hours through our, an agreement we have with uh, Mesa Community College. So there are some, some academic standards tied to that as well. Mr. I'll just want to make one comment to, to help answer the vice mayor's question about the two-person response units. I don't, 
I don't believe it's about trying to figure out ways to send more units out, two person, four person, eight, I don't care. The, the issue with the call volume that would require only two people is that it's not a true emergency. So this is where we get into our behavioral health, our social services, those types of incidents. If we can continue to invest in those programs, hopefully we won't need two person units to send out because we are preventing calls and we're providing the appropriate level of service to those customers. That, I think that's really the direct. Well, yeah, I don't know. I think we'll have to look at it. We have data that's, that I think we responded to BLS or not calls that would get screened out by the behavioral health side of it. So, but we we're, we run this by data, so we'll bring the data and look at it. And, and social services that ultimately prevent those things. And we're not going to prevent all those calls. These are not, uh, yeah, my point is the two-person calls are not all social service calls. There are minor injuries that could still be handled by a two-person unit. So. I just had a question. What did you say the percentage of um, paramedics is currently? We're, we're, we're I'm, I'm guessing, so I don't, don't hold me to it, council member, go forth, but we're at about 67% ALS. Okay. Um, today, and our goal would be, so when we look at that, you look at the several of our support positions. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of like my training division. All of the tr training RTOs that are, that are off of their fire trucks and they're out supporting our recruit academy right now, every one of them are medics. So when you look at positions that are not always on a fire truck, um, that's why we see a little bit higher percentage where we shoot to have our organization somewhere in that 70 to 71 percent ALS. It's because um, a lot of the positions that are not on fire trucks on a, on a daily basis may temporarily be in other assignments and, and they carry medic certs as well. So again, and Corey, this is, let's just emphasize this again. So essentially we're going to be paying our employees to go to school Absolutely. to become paramedics, whereas today... Um, they would have to be doing that outside of their shift hours. Mm -hmm. And so I think- And, and uncompensated. Uncompensated. They, uncompensated. They were doing it on their own time. Now they will be being paid. So it's a huge shift. So I think it's also, for the employees, is a good addition to it, so. Right. To, to that point, our employee group is very, very excited and they worked, I've got to say, I've got to get a lot of, a lot of credit to them. They certainly worked very hard over the last three years to see this come to fruition. Um, and, and we appreciate the support. Thank you, Mayor and Corey. I just add that uh, I believe this is so important for our department to move forward. Having been through the programming that you're talking about, I think, Chief Camelli, most of you have been in the six-month program, right? No? One no, year on our, we all went one, one year on our days off. <laughs> okay, so we, we have both dimensions here. And the one that's most successful is being taught the Mesa way. And that's what we advocated for years is as a paramedic, you're being trained at the Mesa way. And we're taught at the highest standards out there with the most uh, resilient algorithms to provide care to our uh, to our residents and our community. And so I believe this programming will save us money. It will help create better morale for our personnel because that's critical. Because I've heard some whining about, hey, I have to go on my, you know, this day off because I'm going to this one year program. And I said, well, sorry, you signed up for it. I didn't. <laughs> and, and so consequently, it'll just uh, uh, save us money. And then having the other agencies uh, chip in with their personnel and hopefully some of the funding that they have to provide support for the program would be critical. So again, we're kind of reverting back to the old days, I say old days, having been there in the 80s and 90s where we did this programming and it was successful. Mm -hmm. So we're coming full circle about mm -hmm. to provide That's our true. own programming for our own personnel. And I really like the medical transport component because teaching you know, those that are on those units that want to be medics because there's one reason they want to be there. There are well, a couple of reasons. They want to become medics typically and they want to become a fire, uh, fire person, you know, firefighter. So this is a step for them and help them for retention and also for recruitment. So thank you. Ms. Stuff. So the $2 million for this paramedic school, that is for the program itself, or that includes the hours that they'll be paid? So what the, the $2 million encompasses, the majority of that funding is, we are hiring 10 additional firefighters in our organization. We're bringing on 10 FTEs that are suppression, as well as the program manager, so that's the 11th position. But we are hiring 10 additional bodies that will offset the back, cost. Backfill the positions that we're taking off 
of the apparatus to go to school. And it will be ongoing, right? So I, I, we're hiring 10 people every six months. I'm gonna, we, we as a department will take 10 people out of operations and send them to medic school instead of that costing us okay. 10, 10 positions constantly at an overtime rate, we'll just, we'll have those 10 bodies in, in the system. So it's the majority of the funding, the, the program itself, there, there is a couple hundred thousand dollars cost to program management and, and um, equipment and stuff like that, the instructor fees, but the majority of that money is 10 additional Before you bodies. said okay. that the difference in the uh, time to become a paramedic under this program is six months, six months less versus 12. 12. So there's, we're getting that turnaround faster and too. Then so. are we doing anything um, for that retention? I would hate to go through all well, that's this where they, and, they get and they get the them. special assignment pay. It's a paramedic. So there's a financial recognition once they get the paramedic. Okay. I would hate to lose them to We don't other we places. don't we don't they don't leave. Okay. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember <laughs> Duff to, to to Mr. Brady's point. Police officers leave firemen. Our, our our sworn personnel we do not obviously there is a um, that we, we rarely lose sworn Rare. personnel and and certainly the the benefits package that that that's less we do have a tuition reimbursement um, expectation tied to this because we we've, we've tied a tuition cost. So for our our civilian personnel which for to, to Councilmember Freeman's point, some of them are looking for different career paths, which whether it's suppression or something in healthcare, um, you know, whatever that might might be. We do expect, Mr. Brady was kind enough to, to assure us that we should expect some of them may not la may not stay the entire three years that we've asked them to, to commit to this tuition, um, but we do have a program in place that, that they would do it uh, similar to a tuition reimbursement repayment. Yeah, recovery, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, if they don't stick with us that period but of time. Yeah. To oh, that if they point, don't stay three. Yeah. they don't leave the fire service, but they could leave Mesa. They could go to another department. I mean, Mesa, no, you Phoenix. Be using, you got to be using that license. You yeah. got to be using that permit. But we're busy. Mm -hmm. You can go to another town, and that's not as busy. That, right, but then you're going to reimburse us for your. Right. You've got to but that's to her point. It's yep. Yeah. You're committed to three years. But you're saying that's unnecessary for our sworn. Well, it, it I mean, is that it's not likely? Okay. Because yeah. they're walking no... away from more than just. Councilmember Goforth, we don't against. see a, a large turnover just, historically. We look yeah. at that data. We don't see a large number of our suppression, our sworn personnel, leaving us to go to other agencies. It's, it's fairly uncommon. Okay. Um, not that it couldn't happen, yeah. um, but it's it's fairly uncommon. We we I think mm -hmm. recently Chief Lockwin had somebody leave because his his spouse got a job in another state mm -hmm. and he did leave with only a couple years on the job and he got hired as a firefighter somewhere else but it's not a it, it's fairly uncommon i think the the greater concern that we had was more towards our civilian employees who are very early in their career and and some are looking for suppression careers some are looking for health care paths one of the things that we wanted to do and this was i would say a, a driving priority for our city manager's office was to give these EMTs, which are really the very lowest EMS level that we hire in our organization as the civilians, they're, they're kind of demanded that we, we give them a pathway. Where do we give them a career path as a civilian transport EMT to, to stay with us in the city of Mesa? We don't expect that we're gonna keep all of them. Somebody wants to be a firefighter and they happen to get a phone call from Phoenix before Mesa or from Chandler before Mesa. They're going to take that, yeah. but we did put some some stop gaps yeah. in place to say then you need to reimburse yeah. at least what we would project the tuition cost to be. What is suppression? Suppression is our firefighters, Fire. our sworn okay. firefighters, okay. firefighters, engineers, captains, battalion chiefs. That's We're, what I figured, but yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm yeah. sorry about okay. that. And so this is this is the model we anticipate for the future. That's where we're, that's where plan going. Yeah. Okay, and so okay and. So this will just the be built ongoing. into the budget now going forward. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to say I, I, I certainly support this. Uh, this is the mission of the department. But I, in about 20 minutes from now, we're going to stop this meeting so we can go to the uh, uh, the next uh, the service award luncheon. So we're, I, I don't want to shortchange your presentation. I think they're done with their presentation. <laughs> they're done. Are you okay? All right. It's only taking a half hour. All right. Mayor, this well, concludes I, our presentation. I thought there was more was why I was asking. I just didn't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to cut you short.
So any wrap up there, Mary? Or, or? No, I just said that concludes. We appreciate the time. We're excited about the program Chief Hayes was just talking about. And uh, we appreciate your time and we entertain any other questions you may have. Thank you, Council. We do have plenty of time for more questions if you have any. So the good news for the Mayor and Council, you've just done 70% of the budget this morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I just wanted... Like it. I don't want them to be offended that the mayor didn't get emotional talking about the fire department. No. Oh, no, nobody clapped for us either. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, because we appreciate you guys oh, just as much. You. I can cry if you want me to. No need, no need. I just want you to know it's purely because it's 11 o'clock why we're not getting emotional up here, because we really, really, really love our fire department. So, thank you. Rage is an emotion. <laughs> and everybody's hungry. I'm happy to share the crying, you know. <laughs> Uh, having said that, we, we are very proud of you. We consider you an elite department. We brag about you all the time. So thank you. Thanks for being so innovative. Thanks for doing things the Mesa way and coming up with your own paramedic department or a training program and all the other great things that, that make you head and shoulders better than other departments. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving forward with our agenda for this meeting, then item three is to acknowledge receipt of meeting minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Summers and Mr. Freeman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that passes unanimously. Uh, item four is the current event and conferences attended uh, item. Our council members, anything you'd like to share with us? Ms. Billsbury. I know our time's already up, but um, on Tuesday, um, Ian and Lori with Economic Development, we, we went and toured the Atlas Motor Vehicles um, company on Higley and McKillops, and they are a fast-growing battery cell manufacturer that's really having a lot of great vision and, and some fun ideas of, of where to take this EV battery thing to the next level. So I'm, I'm excited to see what they do. And then also I had to say a huge thank you to our fire department and the East Valley United Black Firefighters Group for cooking our pancakes at my spring breakfast. Yeah. And it was such a great turnout. I think we had five or 600 people there. Um, so I want to specifically thank Mesa Art Center for sending out Mabel and Cynthia with Community Services was, um, Community Engagement was amazing, got there at 6 a.m. So many people from the city came and supported it. And the biggest thanks needs to go to our district coordinator, Melissa Hollenbeck, for doing all of the work. She was amazing. So it was just so great. I want to say a huge thank you for that. Thank you. How many eggs did Melissa uh, stuff? Well, Melissa and most of the seventh floor stuffed 2,000 eggs, and my husband and I stuffed 1,000 for our date right. night the night before, and we needed every single one of those eggs. So we will be doing more eggs next year. <laughs> That's right. I know. It was crazy. Yeah, but so fun. That was a great, great event. Thank you to both you and Melissa and everybody who helped put that on. Council, Ms. Duff? Well, right after uh, Julie's um, spring event, PD was at another park, Fire was at her so making the pancakes, and PD put on um, a Reed Park Easter event at Reed Park. I said that. <laughs> they had 10,000 eggs. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. So I, you're just sharing the info for your next year, 10,000 <laughs> eggs. Lots of hot dogs and lots of fun for the whole family. Um, Monday, I was able to um, attend a community court, learn more about that, appreciate the navigators that we do have. They, I, I was amazed how much care and attention goes to each individual going through the program to make sure they're successful. So thank you to NAFA, COPA, and CBI for being our navigators doing that work. On Tuesday, I went to um, Coffee with a Cop at Los Altos Ranch Market at Stapley and Southern. Fiesta PD was there doing um, the program, and Adams Elementary was there with their ESL students. It was good attendance and a very enjoyable outreach. Um, yesterday, some of us, the mayor, maybe others, were at the Phoenix State of the City with uh, Mayor uh, Kate Gallego. She didn't have a DeLorean or anything. It was <laughs> not quite the entertainment, but it did cover a vast amount of information uh, as far as what the city of Phoenix is doing, and I appreciate um, their uh, work in our metropolitan area. And last night I attended um, a privileged national conference opening reception at the Alston House in Washington Escobedo. The conference strives to empower and equip individuals to do equity and justice work through self and social transformation. Appreciate them hosting their conference in Mesa. And coming up this weekend, we have another full weekend. Celebrate Mesa at Pioneer Park from 10 to 2. Everybody come out. Lots of things 
um, and public safety will be there, the sustainability department, most every department will be there. There's a, a fun event for the entire family. And the Mesa Music Festival is starting here, starting tonight. There'll be music um, at um, various uh, breweries and, and restaurants and shops throughout Mesa from Friday night and then Saturday starting at noon and Everclear will be at the McDonald main stage at 8.30 on Saturday night. So lots to do this weekend in downtown Mesa. Thank you. Thank you. Miss, you wanna go? I'll, I'll just say a shout out to I think the mayor and uh, uh, Council Member Freeman and myself went to uh, Dobson Ranch, uh, did a proclamation on their 50th anniversary as a, uh, as a community, as Dobson Ranch was one of the, the first HOA uh, community in the country. Um, and so mayor did a proc proclamation uh, at their board meeting uh, Tuesday. So, and Mr. Freeman was part of the, uh, I feel historic, uh, Vice Mayor. The historic <laughs> panel of uh, as an generations. Amateur, an yeah. amateur historian is what yeah. Frank Meisner said. <laughs> uh, and thank you for the segue. But, uh, you know, this Saturday, we're going to give out free trees at St. Luke's Church from 8 to 10. So come over. We're going to have a safety fair like I've done past at D1. So free pancakes, free trees. And there'll be information on everything from all the other departments. So it helps us celebrate uh, Earth Day, and we'll have a raffle uh, at the tomorrow Mesa booth to earn a tree. And I'm excited about that. And thank you in preparation for all those who'll be coming. There won't be any Easter eggs, <laughs> but again, it'll be a fun time to get together while the air is cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brady, what does our schedule look like? We'll see you on Monday. We have an early start again, so 4.30 start for some presentations. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Ms. Billsbury and Mr. Summers. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned.